keep the government funded for another week. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says the stopgap bill gives negotiators time to finish work on a long-term spending bill. Nobody's going to get everything they want, but the final product will include wins everyone can get behind, including passing the Electoral Count Act, emergency aid for Ukraine, and funding for our kids, our veterans, our small businesses, and our military families. Congress has also passed the National Defense Authorization Act. That's worth $858 billion. This includes a pay raise for troops of 4.6 percent. Republicans also succeeded in forcing lawmakers to lift the COVID-19 vaccine mandate for the military. Well over a foot of snow is expected in parts of the upper northeast today. It's the lingering effects of a massive storm that lumbered over much of the U.S. Winter storm advisories and warnings are posted from Pennsylvania to Maine. Meanwhile, blizzard conditions persist in the Dakotas and parts of Nebraska and Montana. Oregon Attorney General Alan Rosenblum has announced a nearly $700 million settlement with biotech corporation Monsanto. It's the largest settlement the company's paid out over so-called forever chemicals that it produced for decades. Oregon Public Broadcasting's Conrad Wilson has more. Oregon sued Monsanto in 2018, alleging the company's products widely polluted the environment with polychlorinated biphenyls, or PCBs. The state noted in its lawsuit that PCBs are highly toxic. Oregon Attorney General Alan Rosenblum says the chemicals have affected nearly every aspect of Oregon's environment, including waterways where they entered the food supply. Despite knowing that PCBs are toxic, last forever, and escape into the environment, Monsanto manufactured and sold billions of pounds of these dangerous substances. Five other states have settled similar cases with Monsanto. For NPR News, I'm Conrad Wilson in Portland. The World Health Organization says three diseases with ongoing outbreaks are now on the decline. NPR's Ari Daniel reports. Those diseases are COVID-19, MPOX, and Ebola. Many people have gained some immune protection against COVID, either by getting sick, vaccinated, or both. But WHO Director General Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus says the virus is here to stay. It was a guest, now it's almost part of the family. The key is how do we manage this virus? For China, where a large surge in COVID infections is expected early in the new year, the WHO is encouraging a widespread and rapid immunization campaign. The WHO also cited another big challenge, cholera outbreaks in 29 countries worldwide. Ari Daniel, NPR News. On Wall Street, the the Dow was down more than 1%. This is NPR. Good morning. With the latest from the GBH Newsroom, I'm Henry Santoro in studio today. Starbucks workers around the country are planning a three-day strike starting today as part of their efforts to unionize the coffee chain's stores. According to Starbucks Workers United, more than 1,000 baristas at 100 stores have planned to walk out. The strike will be the longest in the year-old unionization campaign. The union says it expects the strike will close some stores entirely at others, managers or other workers may keep those stores open. New Hampshire is joining a growing list of states to ban the Chinese-owned app TikTok from all government phones and laptops. Todd Bookman with the New England News Collaborative reports on the security concerns. In an executive order, Governor Chris Sununu cited what he called the growing cybersecurity threats posed by the popular social media platform TikTok. The Chinese-owned app has more than 94 million users in the U.S., but the FBI has raised privacy and security concerns. At least seven other states have already banned the app from government hardware and networks, and earlier this week, the U.S. Senate unanimously passed a bill that would ban the app from devices issued by the federal government. Along with TikTok, New Hampshire is also banning a handful of other Chinese technologies from state-owned devices. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Todd Bookman. In sports, the Celtics host the Magic at the Garden tonight. And in the forecast, Boston area looking at rain and wind today, tonight, and tomorrow. With temperatures in the low to mid-40s, the Berkshires and some higher elevations. And north of us, we'll see a lot of snow today. Sunny and 40 on Sunday. I'm Henry Santoro, GBH News. Support for NPR comes from DuckDuckGo, a company committed to making privacy online simple. DuckDuckGo's app includes a private search engine, web browser, and email protection with one download. More at DuckDuckGo.com. I'm Henry Santoro. Let's head to the library for Jim and Marjorie and Boston Public Radio. You're 
listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH. Good morning, Jim. Hey there, Marjorie. And if people at the library are wondering, why am I here and why is Marjorie not? Why is she sitting at home? Why are you sitting at home, Marjorie? Because I have COVID. You have COVID, but yes. you're a tough soul and tough you're going to make it through the next three hours. <laughs> By the way, what Marjorie meant to say is the show is also streaming online at youtube.com slash GBH news. And let me just make a, a pitch for the rest of the show. If you were not here this morning hearing uh, Khalid Hill tap uh, as part of Urban Nutcracker or Handel and Haydn rehearsing for when they perform later in the day, you are making a big, big mistake. This is as joyful and terrific as anything, especially right before Christmas. So I really urge you to join us at the Boston Public you know Library. You know what we're doing, Jim? No, I do not. We're offering free Christmas concerts here we at the are. Boston Public Library. We that's are. What we're, that's what we're doing. <laughs> and speaking of the uh, Boston Public Library, politicized right-wing book bans have exploded across the country in recent months, often putting schools, libraries, librarians themselves on the front lines of America's latest culture wars, often at great personal risk. We're starting the show today with the president of the Boston Public Library, our host, David Leonard. David, it's great to see you. Thanks for being here. Hey, Jim. Uh, thanks for having me. Hey, everybody. Uh, Marjorie, it's really weird not having you right next to me when I do this show. So I, know. I can see you on the screen. So I hope, you, hope you're feeling okay and feel better. I'm, I'm feeling better. I'm just still, I, I'm, I'm infectious for two more days, so I have to be careful. All right. Good. But anyway, I, 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 want to, um, I want to talk to you about what seems to be this attack on librarians all around the country, some losing their jobs, some uh, quitting because they can't take it anymore because they're being attacked by parents upset over the books in their libraries. What's going on here? Yeah, I think we've seen over the last um, couple of years in particular a rise. Um, this is nationwide. We can talk about Boston separately and talk about what's going on in the country um, as two separate dimensions. Um, I also want to distinguish a little bit between what school librarians are experiencing and what public librarians are experiencing, because I don't think they play out exactly the same way. But yes, it is absolutely true that in parts of the country, we are seeing a politicization of the role of libraries in, uh, in their communities um, at the very time where we probably need um, a shared space where people from any set of values and any set of beliefs can be in the space together and get what information they need. So um, this, this is not helpful to that, that larger goal of the role of public libraries in society today. Can you uh, expand upon that a little bit? For, for someone who is not a, a right-wing zealot who just read something online and becomes part of this book banning campaign. Explain to people who are not up to speed, who do have some concerns about what their kid may read, why Toni Morrison's first book, The Bluest Eyes, or Gender Queer, why is that okay, or why is it necessary, actually, to be in a public library? Well, a public library, particularly one like ours that's also a research library, um, should have all viewpoints and all information um, represented to, to uh, help people with their information needs or, or reading. Um, I think it's incredibly important um, to acknowledge that public libraries have a special responsibility for voices that are otherwise not uplifted in society, whether, whether it's the kid who's coming out, uh, whether it's someone who's trying to understand the history of this country, and slavery from multiple, percep multiple perspectives, um, fill in blanks the way many of us were taught, whether in this country or wherever we grew up. And so I think having all of those viewpoints in the public library is, is essential. It's essential to democracy. There's no mandatory reading list. I, you know, <laughs> you're, you're here a couple of times a week. We, we don't hand you, as a, as a resident, a mandatory reading list for what you must, uh, you must take out and must, must absorb. So, you know, none of this work takes the place of, you know, caregivers or parents making decisions about what, what they and their family want to have available for a certain age. So, um, let's let the librarians do the job about what what is the right things to have in the collection. Um, we may choose with programming and reading lists and so on to um, uplift particular lists or particular um, sets of books, um, but let's let them do their jobs and then um, people can choose what they, what they want or what they need or what's appropriate for their family and their belief systems. You know what I wondered, uh, David Leonard, back in history, you know, a lot of books 
were banned that are no longer banned, things like James Joyce Ulysses or, or uh, I, I think even D.H. Lawrence's, some of his books, Lady Chatterley's Lover, or The Tropic of Cancer, sure. and those kinds of things. How, it, but this was a long time ago. But, but tell us what that meant to libraries way back when. Well, I think it was, it would, there were always discussions about things that were perceived to be um, controversial. Um, not just should you acquire them, but where should you have them? And, you know, it's, you know, we've always had a challenge process. If someone's concerned about a particular book, you file a challenge and we'll review it and see, you know, is it about, is it about being um, cataloged in the right way? Is it for, you know, maybe something that's in the children's library should be in the teens and not in, or in the adult section? You know, those are simple little corrections to process that can happen any of the time. Uh, but we've certainly seen an evolution of our society that certainly allows for books that you just mentioned, Marjorie, to be part of the, um, you know, things that maybe are, were too racy in the uh, early parts of the 1900 or, or you know, whatever the, 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 the values that needed to evolve to where they are today, but it's, it's not about, it should not be about telling other people what they should or should not have access to. That's an individual choice. You know, by the way, I'm going to say something that's probably totally unnecessary if you're uh, a sentient up person who stands upright. Uh, 85 to 90 percent of the books that are banned or have been attempted to be banned around the country are not surprisingly about LGBTQ themes and about people of color, and again, I'm sure that will surprise nobody. I want to get back to, do you call it challenge is the word? Is yes, that the word? Yeah. So if a person, if a parent of good will, for argument's right. sake, is concerned about right. a book or where it is, and they call the library or they go to the main desk over there, they'd be told this, that there is a vehicle yes. to question something, right. and they'll get a response, and right. it goes from there. Right, and, and sometimes we direct people also to, you know, requesting a book. If you think there's, you know, another perspective or another um, book that you'd like to see in the collection, propose that. You know, in some cases, um, as long as it's not, you know, hate speech or uh, conspiracy theory, uh, unless that's getting parked in our research collection, we're probably going to order it if we can get it. Um, whether we promote it or not is a whole different different matter. You know, David, often when I'm trying to reach you, you're at some librarian convention or something with your fellows all over the country and actually all over the, the world. How big a concern uh, uh, is this? I, I know you're going to talk about Boston in a minute. It's at different levels of intensity in different parts of the country. Uh, but in the librarian community as a whole, how concerned are people? Um, very. Uh, it adds stress to what is already a particularly stressful job, particularly in the last couple of years. Uh, we have seen directors resign. We have seen uh, in parts of the country where library boards are elected or appointed, that's getting politicized as well. And, um, you know, you were, you were making the point a moment ago that the types of books on the list now are different than the ones that Marjorie was yeah. talking about. So, um, you know, this may very well prevent people you know, um, people from access to information that, that they need for survival. You know, I, I certainly know that I turned to the library as a, as a gay kid growing up, and for me it was more in college, that, you know, I wanted to read more about what, what, what am I going through, what is this about, are there other people like me? And, you know, you, you go to the library for those moments, and um, um, if they're not there, then we are putting, we're actually putting our youth at risk which is exactly what some of these um, challengers would, would claim that their, their values are based on protecting. You know, I just want to say, Marjorie, before you continue, for when you heard David say a minute ago, you know, some school board members, some library board members, there's an organized campaign around the country. The people who are the book banners, for lack of a better expression, are running candidates, are raising a ton of money. There are politicians, this will not surprise you, Ron DeSantis in Florida, the front runner for the Republican nomination for the presidency, is intimately involved in the Florida-based groups that are trying to do these things under the, the umbrella notion of parental rights, which is sort of the euphemistic way to be pitching this. We're talking about book banning with David Leonard, well, head of the Boston Public <clears throat> Library. You know, this gets back to something that I think is an essential question. You're not running a school library, so it's different, but just as you, you think librarians, I, I think of librarians as scholarly people who understand the world of books. Obviously, that's what they do, that they're in the best position to curate what comes into their library. And I think the same thing of school librarians, I think the same thing of teachers. Jim and I argue a lot about teachers unions, but I certainly would not presume to know better than a teacher 
what the curriculum should be, and I certainly wouldn't presume to know better than a librarian what the what the book should be in the library. So this idea that parents, who most of whom have no training in in this in either education or library studies, should be in charge of this, I, I think is under parental rights seems to me bizarre. But I, I agree. I mean, I think in the teaching profession, in the library profession. Um, People go to school, they have master's degrees, um, they have specialties in this area, they have a training on the job, they have experience. Um, perhaps this is more of a lack of trust in expertise generally in, yeah. in, in society, and it, it's more about the, the social zeitgeist. But yeah, if, if um, librarians are quitting jobs because of the stress of this or being forced out by their, by their, by their boards, then this is very worrying, not just for the individual, but for society as a whole. You know, so when you say librarians being forced out, I just want to spend a minute on this. You know, we talked a lot on this show, particularly during the January 6th hearings, when those two incredibly courageous uh, women, mother and daughter, talked about death threats, how they couldn't go out of their houses anymore. Uh, and not only was that not exaggerated, when you read the story in the New York Times, which Margie and I read this morning, there are death threats being directed against people who work at libraries. Yes. I mean, I hope people will stop for a minute and not just nod their head. People who choose to work historically in anonymity as an election worker to make sure that democracy, small d, continues to work in this country, either quitting, hiding out, being threatened, their lives being threatened, and people who dedicate their lives to educating people in libraries in parts of the country are getting death threats, and as you say, some of whom, some of these lead librarians, quitting because of the pain, anxiety, and threats that they're having to experience. So this is not some abstract issue, but a real scary one that I think is another threat to democracy. So, you know, if you visit the library um, and you want to say just thank you to a exactly. library staff member for what they're doing, you know, I really encourage people to do that because they may be making a difference in people's lives in a way that, that uh, is not transparent or not known in a, in a very positive way. We know that happens all the time, but, you know, take a minute, say thank you. You know, I, I was looking down the list of most banned, but what is wrong with Harry Potter, according to these nuts? I know you, you wouldn't use the word nuts. What is the Harry Potter sin, David Leonard? Uh, so there are, there are two dimensions to J.K. Rowling's problematic uh, work. Uh, the original reason, I think, I think one of the books made it onto the 2019 ALA top 10 most, most challenged books yeah. uh, is because of the role of witchcraft in the fantasy and fiction story that <laughs> all of her works uh, um, are. What, we're um, going to groom kids to become <laughs> witches? Is that the fear? <laughs> um, you know, I think there are certainly um, some uh, Christian more extreme values that would have a problem with witchcraft. Um, certainly that was true in the Middle, middle Ages and the 1600s here. Uh, but this is the 21st century and not the 1600s. And you were saying there's a second aspect. You said there Yeah, two. I think um, some of her portrayal of um, uh, gender issues and some of her commentary outside oh, of the, the works the trans is, stuff is, is um, grotesque. But really that's not why... Difficult. But that's no, not, not what the bulk of the book is No, but is that's about. why I think there are, there are two reasons that, uh, that, that she could be seen as problematic. But I still think they're great stories yeah. regardless. Let's, you know, so... You know, when, 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 you, when you mentioned <laughs> saying a thank you to a librarian, when you think of the role librarians have played in your life when you were a little kid and you went to the library and you got advice and, and they showed you where the stacks were and the Dewey Decimal System and all these things. I mean, you think of librarians almost like it's nurses, some of the people most beloved, one of the most beloved professions and just kind of so upstanding and so helpful and so involved, especially if you went to the library, so many kids do after school right. to do their homework, right? right. Yeah. And they have uh, a place to go after school. It's just kind of incredible how people can turn on librarians uh, on a dime. I just find it quite, and accuse them, as these people have, of, of grooming children because they have books on LGBTQ kids. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a little difficult to grasp. Um, and luckily, in Boston, we have not seen quite this level of uptick that we have in, uh, in other parts of the what country. What have we seen? Um, a very, very modest change in the number of challenges, but we look at them and they will know that's, that's perfectly fine to be here. There's nothing, nothing wrong. And are the challenges primar in the same areas we're talking about around um, the country? Or? Somewhat, but, um, but not, not, we haven't seen a, a, a really 
you know, noticeable either change in volume or type. So uh, I'm assuming that that uh, uh, this will be an issue in the 2024 national elections, just like you know, teaching critical studies, which was not being taught in any high schools, was an issue about the high schools. I don't know if it's Florida or where, wherever it is. What's the antidote? I mean, I, I don't mean the rhetorical antidote. I know you can say we just have to speak the truth. And what what do we do to address this so that this doesn't get even deeper? And, well, I mean, it really is a threat to the. I mean, I'm, you're the last person I need to tell. It's not just a, a threat to individuals and to their ability to expand their minds and find things that affirm their lives. And for those of us who need to learn about other people, we get to learn. It, it really is a threat to freedom in so many of ways. It, it can become that for sure. I think it's very important to realize that the, the role that libraries are playing is actually essential to a supportive um, democracy. This is, this is a space, this is, um, you know, this is almost a million square foot of space across mm. these two buildings here at, uh, at, uh, at Copley Square. And you know, it's a symbol of the value that everybody is welcome. We, we don't ask you what your beliefs or values or what they are at the door. Um, you can come in, you can hang out, you can, you can watch the radio, um, you can um, uh, use the space for a project you're working on, you can borrow a book, whether it's a print book or an electronic book. We've got to continue valuing this role um, and ensuring that everybody is welcome. We won't tolerate ha hate speech. We will not tolerate uh, people who uh, maybe are interfering with someone else's enjoyment of the library or pursuit of knowledge. Uh, but we've got to value these things and ensure that they, um, they continue to get used. Um, this is a, a symbol of, of the type of society we want to live in. Martin. Well, I, you know, I, I, I don't know if you could do it in a library, but I know when people, parents get all in a huff about sex ed in school, uh, <clears throat> lots of times, at least in Massachusetts, you have the option to have your child opt out. The other kids will have their sex ed and you'll go to the library, I guess, and read all those nefarious books in the library or something. But it seems as though that if, if parents are so worked up about this, then they can have a little list of books that their kids aren't allowed to take out or something like that. Instead. That makes me nervous too, by the way. I mean, well, it's sort I don't of think like... it's great either, but it's, it's better than what's happening with people being, librarians being reported to authorities and labeled pedophiles on social media and getting death threats and being harassed. Well, maybe instead of putting the library in the middle, I don't mean to put you in the middle, David, maybe a parent should talk to their kid and say if a parent doesn't want their kid reading something, then have a conversation with your child yeah, rather than having the library exactly. be the censor in terms of this kind of thing. You know, uh, uh, this is a real, I'm really glad you spent some time with us and we thank you, but I wanna ask you a question, an artistic question before you go. Marjorie spent about five hours this morning trying to getting a little background on her <laughs> Zoom camera because she has a white I wall. I like the holiday lights that are think? coming through. That was the best What do the I people do? in the audience think of the holiday lights? <laughs> That's actually. I was trying to get one of those tropical backgrounds, but I'm so inept I couldn't out. figure out how to do it. So here I am. <laughs> we'll, we'll get you a backdrop off the Newsfeed Cafe for. Thank for, you. For that would be lovely. I have that backdrop. You know, David, we not only appreciate your work every day, we really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. And as always, we can't, couldn't be happier spending a couple of days, maybe more at some point here at the Boston Public Library. Sounds good. Thanks for your time, Thank you. David Leonard. Thank appreciate you so it. much, David. Really appreciate it. David Leonard is the president of the Boston Public Library. We very much appreciate him coming down to speak with us. Coming up, the text and phone lines are open at 877-301-8970. It is the season of giving. And now that the former president, that would be Donald Trump, has new NFTs for sale, we want to know... This is unbelievable, this are story. Are you ready to buy a beautiful NFT featuring Trump's little head peering out of a spacesuit, or a picture of Trump pretending to be a race car driver or a county sheriff, all dressed up with his badge and his 10-gallon hat. Stick around. <clears throat> Donald Trump has gone to a new level here, and we're going yes. to talk about it. You're listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH. This week, heads of state from across Africa have been in Washington for the U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit, pushing forward on critical issues like climate change, as well as China and Russia's influence across a continent. These leaders are also connecting with their citizens who live here in the U.S. 
the president of Somalia visiting Somalis in Minnesota next time on The World. This afternoon at 3, here on GBH News 89.7. Support for our programs comes from you and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. You can start the new year by joining their team of professionals dedicated to advancing ocean science and technology. Learn more about openings at whoi.edu slash team. And Chevalier Theatre in Medford Square, presenting Il Devo, a new day tour, with guest vocalist Stephen Labrie, March 1st at 8 p.m. Tickets and more information are available at chevaliertheater.com. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. I'm Jim Browdy. Marjorie Egan is at home. She still has COVID. She's doing better, but she's a trooper, so she's here. Well, she's not here, but she's here on the radio. I am live at the Boston Public Library, streaming online at youtube.com slash GBH News. And I assume if you stream it online, you can see Marjorie with the Christmas lights and this ridiculous background thing <laughs> she uh, uh, created. And as I said you earlier, like it? <laughs> I, it's actually pretty cute. Uh, uh, two things. One, we have incredible performances later. Music from uh, Handel and Haydn and tapping from uh, Urban uh, Nutcracker with Khalid Hill. And I saw them rehearse. It's fabulous. And Tuesday at noon, uh, ask the governor-elect. Uh, Maura Healy will join us live at the library at noon. We hope you do too. So it's a time of year where everybody is scrambling to find that perfect last-minute Christmas gift. When it's too late to order online because of delivery times, or you're looking to buy something for someone who has virtually everything, what do you do? Well, luckily for all of us, Former President Trump has us covered. Hello, everyone. This is Donald Trump, hopefully your favorite president of all time, better than Lincoln, better than Washington, <laughs> with an important announcement to make. Oh I'm gosh. doing my first official Donald J. Trump NFT collection right here and right now. My official Trump digital trading cards are $99, which well, doesn't sound like very much for what you're getting. Exactly. The text and phone lines are open at 877 877- I've never. 301-8970. Semi-serious questions here. How are you reacting to this latest scam out of a former president of the United States? Now, if A.G. Garland, Manhattan DA Alvin Bragg, the House January 6th Committee can't bring Trump down, will shilling for useless, badly photographed, photoshopped NFTs be the things that cook them? 877 877- 301-8970. If you're watching on YouTube or you're at the library, we're going to put up some of these photographs in a couple of minutes. Now, we have some really bad news to start this. What? Really what? bad news. What? Trump's NFTs have sold out of their initial <laughs> round of purchasing. That means, this is incredible. At 99 each, he has raised a mere $4.5 million so far. And the rarest of these NFT cards... That's of the 45th president standing in front of the Statue of Liberty holding a torch, which is really what it looks like, is currently listing, I guess right before it sold out, at a mere $24,000. Our number is 877-301-8970. What do you think of this, Marjorie? Well, I, I think to myself, are people buying these as kind of a joke? Well, I, I mean, guess they are. Oh, well, as a joke. Oh, I don't know. It yeah, because when you see these pictures, even if you're a big Trump person yeah. like Steve Bannon is, yeah. I mean, this is a step too far for him. The president looks absolutely ridiculous, I think he, he looks sort of sexy, actually. He you know, looks sort of sexy. The only, the only picture that is remotely looks like him is the one where he's playing golf, where yeah, he's in his backswing. Like yeah. <laughs> so he looks like a like a overweight 70 something guy with a pair of baggy khaki pants you know and and he's in that picture and then in the rest of them he's dressed up like he's you know Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible when yeah. Tom Cruise was about 30 years old i mean he looks he looks like a fool so okay. i don't know who falls for this or what well, I'll tell you, you know fell I mean? for four point five million dollars of fallers. <laughs> yeah, but fell you think it's a I buy them too, Who but I cares spend ninety nine bucks. Well, exactly. Ninety nine if it's a dollar, I'd buy one too. And by the way, don't ask us to explain NFTs because as Steve on YouTube just uh, posted, you can right click on the images and get them for free. So we don't really understand that, but we, apparently four and a half million dollars worth of people do. Now Marjorie referenced Steve Bannon. If yes. there is any loyal sycophant of Donald right. Trump, it is Steve Bannon. He created him, he continues to push him. Here is his reaction to Trump, as he said, Trump's big announcement is on Bannon's podcast. I can't do this anymore. <laughs> 
he's one of the greatest presidents in history. But I got to tell you, whoever, what business partner, and anybody in the comms team, and anybody in Mar Lago, and I love the folks down there, but we're at war. Mm-hmm. They ought to be fired today. Exactly. 877-301-8970. And by the way, again, we rarely take calls out of order. If by any chance there's somebody in our audience who can, with a straight face, say they spent $99 to get one of these babies, please tell who's ever screening the calls, and we'll put you up to the top of the list. And, really, <coughs> and by the way, we'd probably put you at the top of the list if you sincerely said that you would buy one if one was available. You know, can we put up the, the, the fo- I don't know what is the most incredible. Uh, the audience here, you're not gonna be able to see this, but it'll be on the screen in a minute. Here's Donald Trump in sunglasses in a space suit. Can you, can you, <laughs> how many of you, could you please raise your hands at the library if you would pay $99 to have a digital copy of this? I'm sorry, I don't see your hands. Look at that, look at that picture. Apparently there is no, but how good at, does he, oh, there it is right there. tiny his head in? looks. His, yeah. t- his head looks really teeny. Yeah. He's, he's got a big head. Now I can see the appeal of this. Can't you see the appeal of this thing? <laughs> you know, by the way, he says, we played you the sound bite. I have a big, I have an important announcement. Uh, Joe Biden tweeted and saying, I have a big announcement too. Uh, like inflation easing, I just signed the Respect for Marriage Act. We brought Brittany Griner home. Gas prices are lower than a year ago. 10,000 new high-paying jobs in Arizona. That's his major announcement. Trump's is he is selling NFT trading cards <laughs> of himself in spacesuits. You know, in all, you know, I don't even know. I, I don't know. Listen in any to case, this. Listen to this. Just spoke to my son in Maine who said his credit card was hacked to the tune of $1,000 buying the Trump cards. I couldn't help but laugh. So wait a second. So that guy means he attempted to buy a Trump card? Apparently somebody uh, uh, succeeded in buying a Trump card on his, uh, hacking his son's credit card. That's unbelievable. 877-301-8970. So I guess our point is, I'm not sure what our point is, but our point is, would you buy one of these things if you had an opportunity and maybe have you bought one of these and you had the opportunity. What are you going to say? No, Jim, I think some of our listeners are suspicious. What do you mean? Um, well, uh, the NFTs are all sold out. If you can believe it, says Paula from Hingham, I think Eric bought them to win dinner with his dad or Jared did to make daddy, uh, Junior did to make daddy happy and he'll give them out the next CPAC event. The, the fact that someone would buy these right away from the Trump camp to sell them out is is probably closer to what's really going on here. You know, by the way, someone said, you know, these are NFTs and someone uh, texted, they didn't say who they are. NFT stands for no effing thank you. So I think, <laughs> I think that probably, <laughs> Al on the road, this is really, I have to, this is a top fiver for me. Al on the road, you're first on Boston Public Radio. What's up? Um, hey guys. Hey. Uh, so you guys want the NFTs I bought for you for Christmas? <laughs> <laughs> We're waiting. Thank you, Al. We knew you would. What do you think of this? Uh, I, I think Trump's a genius. I don't have. I haven't had any ideas in my 52 years on this earth that generated four and a half million dollars yeah. overnight. Yeah, it's um, really but, fit, it also fitting for a former president, don't you think? Absolutely. But <laughs> if you ever needed any more evidence that MAGA is a cult and he's the leader, this should do it for you. Uh, well, I would say that is probably uh, true. Al, send us the gifts. Thank you so much for the call. Can yeah. I hold this thing up? Is that what you're pointing to? Okay, uh, uh, let me hold up another one. If you're watching on YouTube, Al, if you're watching on YouTube, you should check this out. This one, can you come closer on this, please? Oh, I love that This one. is really lovely. This yeah. is Donald Trump in a long, uh, I guess, leather sheriff's <laughs> outfit with a cowboy. Oh, there it is. It's up there. Now, that is really an attractive man, I think. I mean, I'm with Paula from Hingham. What does he say? I think that these are bought as an inside job. You know how the, if, if you um, buy, write a book that's favorable to Trump, exactly. it, you go, it, they'll have these book fairs where they'll, someone will buy like 50,000 copies of them, right. of the yeah, books. 10,000 of them, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah that's so they right. go up to the number one or whatever exactly. they go up to. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. 877 301 8970. Barb in Somerville, what do you think of the Trump NF- uh, NFTs? Hi. I love your show. Thanks. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Um, I told your producer, I, I am just crushing the irony that all the people that are paying this $99 are like, Wow, wow, wow. Inflation is so bad. Gas prices are so high. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. But this is but an investment. Barb, 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 this is an investment. Trust me. Down the line, <laughs> these are really going to be worth something. 
Well, I also think it's a political thing because if there's any better form of birth control than seeing those pictures, <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a pretty good one. <laughs> That's a pretty. You're getting applause here at the library, Barb. Well, Barb, you know, I'm with you. I mean, does he think he looks macho? I guess he does. Does he think he looks attractive? I mean, he just looks like a fool, doesn't he? It's kind of like the the nerdy guy in high school kind of showing up in the football out uniform. Except the nerdy guy in high school wasn't president of the United States. You know what I mean? Barb, you're fabulous. Thank you for the call. We appreciate it. I guess that makes it even more pathetic. You know, you know, I'm trying. Unlike Marjorie, uh, every day I'm trying to be balanced here in this okay. discussion. So here is you don't just get the NFT for ninety nine dollars. Listen yep. to this. Here is uh, Trump, excuse me, President Trump, explaining one of the added perks that comes with buying the ninety nine dollar NFT trading card. Though it sounds like he's not all that impressed. Listen and decide for yourself. Here it is. Here's one of the best parts. best parts. Each card comes with an automatic chance to win amazing prizes like dinner with me. I don't know if that's an amazing prize, mm-hmm. but it's what we have. It is what we have. It's all we have. And by the way, for if you buy two cards, Nick Fuentes will join you for dinner at <laughs> Mar-a-Lago. This is unbelievable. Several people want to know if the Trump NFTs are a great money laundering method. Well... <laughs> There is Ozark, as we all learned about money laundering. 877-301-89. By the way, I looked this thing up, the the, uh, dinner thing. I should have said this. This is another. uh, Talk about scams. So you buy a card for $99, which I assume is worth nothing. I assume. Maybe I'm wrong. And then you enter this drawing where you can win a dinner at Mar-a-Lago. Here's a quiz for you, Marjorie, based on my research this morning. If you win the prize at dinner at Mar-a-Lago, who pays your plane fare? I, I bet you have to pay it yourself. You do. And who pays for your hotel in Florida? <laughs> I to bet go you di- have to pay that yourself, That is exact. Too. <laughs> but you do get to have dinner with Kanye West and the president. George and Weymouth, you're next on Boston Public Radio. Thank you for calling. Hi. Hi, guys. Hi. Uh, I just want to point out, if you want to save yourself 97 bucks, 99. you can get a $2 Trump uh, d- uh, bill. It's a dollar bill with Trump's face. And uh, myself, I just think it would be more appropriate to put it on a $3 bill. Well, that's good. <laughs> By the way, that, that actually is good, and it's very wise investment advice. George, thank you for sharing that with us. We appreciate it. Oh, uh, we don't have the picture, as, as someone reminds us of, of the president uh, in his golf shorts. Remember that picture that we no, seen of him? No, I never saw from- that. Um, well, let's not body shame the guy. I mean, you know, I mean, he is what he is. He's an older man, and he's a little a dad overweight. Even though, remember that doctor who said he was the fittest president? <laughs> not only the fittest president, I think he said a couple of minutes ago, better than Washington, better than Lincoln. Yeah, he's better than Washington, better than Lincoln. So that's pretty Lincoln. incredible. That's right. Let's go to John and Gardner. John, what's your deal? Well, Merry Christmas, Jim and Marjorie, first of all. And to you, Thank of course. Thank you, John. Will you pass along to Jared? I said, happy Kwanzaa, Jim. He said he enjoyed hearing. Happy I will Kwanzaa, do it. He's Jim. probably listening. We hope he's listening, but we'll tell him. And Marjorie, you feeling well, dear? I hope. I'm feeling better. Thank you. All right, Marjorie, I had a big decision to make yes. the last couple of days. Yeah. You know, times are tough. Finances are tough. $99 for the uh, Trump card or 120 bucks to donate again to attempt to get a, a smugger than smug mug again. <laughs> Too late. Oh, wait a, a minute. Ball. Too wait a late. Minute. Huh? You, don't, you don't have a smug mug, John? I have the, the first one I told you. Um, it, uh, it survived when I threw it at Dick Cheney on Trump's <laughs> inauguration day, <laughs> but it didn't survive another incident. I oh, have no. The smugger mug. I have the smugger mug, but I don't have the smugger than smug is possibly envisioned <laughs> by a human being mug, oh my God. Uh, in my repertoire. You know, Marjorie... I, you weren't around. The new iteration, which I think is the fourth Smug Mug, was only available for one day before the one-day pledge, which means the next pledge, which I assume will be in the spring, the new one will be available. And I have to say it may be the best yet. So wait a few months and your time will uh, come there, John. John, Merry John, Christmas you're very you. generous. Thank you very much. Now, let me ask you a question. One of our colleagues put up a, a new picture. BPR NFT now available right. of Trump for only 99 cents. Is there any way we can put that up? This is really unkind, but it's Christmas week. You what were just criticizing me for body shaming. I know, Jim, but I hadn't, seen the, the I hadn't seen the photograph. He was playing tennis. I, was, I got it wrong. He wasn't playing golf. He was, he was playing tennis. Very he was attractive. Tennis whites. Tennis whites. <laughs> From behind, should, from behind. We should no, say. he had not. He did not include that in his NFT he did sale. Not. 
Uh, 877-301-897. You know, I'm just looking at these. So he's the sheriff in the West. That's with right. With a long coat and the He's badge. a race car driver. He's a race car driver. Uh, with He's an astronaut. He's uh, with uh, gold uh, bars uh, saying That's Trump right. on them. Yeah. The golf one is not that interesting. It's actually a nice picture of him. And he's the astro. He's the astro. Oh, and the race car. Oh, you said race car driver. Uh, oh, and he's wearing gold boxing gloves. Oh, there are tons of them. Gold yes, boxing gloves. gold boxing gloves. And they gloves. all sold out. I think you look at that and you think, my God, like Muhammad Ali. Exactly. Isn't that just incredible? Look at that. It is just look incredible. Look at that physique. Look at that powerful man. Uh, you know, uh, our list, our uh, texters, Jim, my, my call screener is not working. I hope you got that message. Oh, But I'm no, reading the text. Well, it's not. And I'll try to fix it during the break. Um, I have text. Our texters do not think anybody but some insider has bought these things. I don't, I don't buy that. I don't buy You think... Th I mean, what's the deal? He says they all sold out four and a half million. So the next batch, it's an enticement kind of thing to use. Yeah, he words. wants to. He wants to make it seem. They make them seem more valuable. Now, uh, before we take a break, which we have to, I'm going to hold up this photograph that we are going to attempt. I don't know if we have the skills to make it into an NFT and sell it for 99 cents. Okay. Rather than 99 dollars. Can someone zero in on this? This is very <laughs> fetching. <laughs> Are there people who'd be interested? In, are there a lot? Everybody in the library said they'd buy this. It's a very, it's very unkind. But Marjorie made me do that. I didn't want to do it. We got to take a break, Marjorie. Okay, we're taking a break. This guy was the president of the United States of America. He got seventy. How many? Seventy-three million 75 votes. Million, Seventy-five in the last 75, election, right? and he's running yeah. again. Yeah, we're getting your reaction to this year's must-have holiday gift. Must -have. <laughs> full set of a Donald full... Trump. Wait, you get them all for ninety nine dollars? I think they're ninety nine a piece. Oh, I you have think to spend so like a thousand dollars to get them those, all, Jim. Yeah, but no much. price is too high. No price. We're going to keep talking about this after a quick break. Our number is eight seven seven three zero one eight nine seven zero eight seven seven three zero one eight nine seven zero. You're listening to Boston Public Radio, broadcasting from the Boston Public Library, and streaming online at youtubecom News. I'm Adam Riley. Tonight on Talking Politics, we're digging into the biggest stories of 2022, from Florida Governor Ron DeSantis shipping migrants to Martha's Vineyard, to the litany of problems plaguing the MBTA, to Democrat Maura Healey cruising to victory in the governor's race after pitching herself as the successor to outgoing Republican Charlie Baker. That and more on Talking Politics, tonight at 7 on GBH2 and online at gbhnews.org. Support for GBH comes from you and Clover Food Lab with 15 locations in the Boston area offering meal boxes delivered to your door. Clover Food Lab is committed to changing the vegetable game. Learn more at CloverFoodLab.com and Comcast. Xfinity Internet is committed to bringing speeds over a gig to power your devices while fitting your needs and a range of budgets. Learn more at Xfinity.com slash gig. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Marjorie Egan and Jim Browdy. Marjorie's home, still has COVID, but she's doing a little bit better. Uh, I'm Jim Browdy. I'm at the Public Library, and we are streaming online at youtube.com slash gbhnews. A couple of things. One, uh, Maura Healy joins us on Tuesday uh, for Ask the Governor-Elect. She will be here in person at the Boston Public Library at noon. And by the way, a ton of you, and I thank you, are mentioning last night's final night on Greater Boston where Marjorie made a star Oh, turn. my God. I don't, know, I don't want to talk about it today. Yeah, uh, thank Jim, you all. It was we'll one of the best shows Thanks. of all time. People Maybe should look at it. It was a riot. Thanks. And thank you. And you were great. And uh, thank you for nice, oh, everybody's nice comments. Well, not everybody's nice comments. Those who gave me nice comments. We'll talk about it for a minute on Monday, but not today. Karen watching on YouTube says, that tennis photo, I can't un <laughs> see that now. And here is okay. Bill from Beverly who says, I'd pay $299 for an NFT of Jim in a dicky. It's coming. <laughs> okay. It's here's coming Roger. to a place near here's you. Here's Roger in Putnam. He says, yeah. did I miss it? Where's the one that shows Trump grabbing women by the, you know what? <laughs> That's... You can get that one. Jim from North Reading says the obvious. What did P.T. Barnum say? And Anne-Marie exactly. from Atkinson, New Hampshire wants to know whether the NFTs come with a free my pillow. Well, think, speaking Jim? of that, Anne from North Attleboro is on a similar theme. Anne, welcome to the show. How are you, Anne? Thank you so much. I hope I hope you feel better. I oh, just thank wanted you. to question why 
Why didn't he have the My Pillow guy do the voiceover? Mike Lindell, that's brilliant. That would have been that would have been brilliant. That is that is brilliant. <laughs> would have been very good. <laughs> you and thank you. We have bad connection. We got to let you go, but thank you for your suggestion. I think it's brilliant. We'll pass it along to the president's office at uh, Mar-a-Lago. Paul from Marshfield thought it, it had to be the it, the it, when the big announcement came out. He thought the Onion had knocked it out of the park, and the Onion, of course, is the great uh, satirical uh, website that is. Uh, of course, making jokes all the time, and he thought it was a joke. You know, speaking of jokes, I hope people are. I, I, we didn't make maybe we didn't make this clear when I read Biden's tweet saying I have major announcements in capital letters. Trump literally uh, put out that he had a major announcement to make. He did, and most sane people uh, assumed it had something to do with his candidacy or some issue that he was concerned with. And uh, instead, it was to sell um, these NFTs of him. Well, for there's no other. Bucks. Then Steve Bannon said, who, who, who thought this was a good idea? Yeah. They shall be fired. Yeah. People thought this was a good idea, shall be fired. Hi, Jared. Okay, uh, here is uh, Mike and Sturbridge. Hey, uh, Mike, how are you? I'm doing great. How about yourself? We're never better, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I've been listening to this all the way up the road until I got, got to Sturbridge, and I'm telling you. I couldn't, I, I, I was laughing so hard I was having a hard time driving. <laughs> this guy... <laughs> This guy, he obviously, his, his company just got convicted of, of tax fraud Excellent and point. all kinds of things Excellent like that. Point. So he must be needing money to keep his company afloat because they're going to go bankrupt. This guy is a jabron, I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> Beautifully put, Mike. That was an excellent summary and an excellent uh, call. By the way, uh, we should also play Newsmax, because that, isn't that one of Trump's favorite networks oh, now that yes, Fox absolutely. News has turned on him? Here's how some of the hosts over at Newsmax, which I'm sure you will watch regularly, reacted to yesterday's big announcement. Here it is. So, uh, that is his major announcement. Many thought it would be political. Many thought it would be about maybe uh, creating a new party. I mean, there was so much speculation on this. Uh, but it's not that. It's a digital trading card. It's 99 bucks, and he said it would make a great Christmas gift. So, oh, there's a bunch of them. Interesting timing for that. <laughs> <laughs> I am sorry. This is one of the most you know, incredible things <clears throat> ever. You know what's weird about this? I yeah. mean, no, you know, what's weird about it, Marjorie? That y you have to give this to Trump. I mean, he is a genius in television, right? He's being ridiculed He's across the country. Yes, but um, uh, what is weird is that a guy that so got it in terms of what would help him become the president of the United mm -hmm. States was so able to ridicule and then based and belittle his way to the presidency and insult people and yeah. stuff and be a TV personality that he clearly either he's lost it all together or, or something because this is like making him well, look like a fool. So it's you like, say he's, he's you say completely he's not getting it. You say he's a genius, right? So he's sitting down and saying, I'm trailing DeSantis in that poll, USA Today, David Paleologos right. from Suffolk. And he said, I think what I need, could you focus on this, please, is I think an NFT of me as an astronaut will propel me back into the lead in the <laughs> Republican. Now, you look at this, you say, I'm really not that into Trump anymore. And then you say, well, wait a second. I have this. Don't go away, please. Keep this here. And I have this. He's a race, whoa, race car. Maybe I can support the, this uh, man for the, pro what? Uh, actually, let me do one more. I'm sorry I'm obsessed with this, but I can't get over it. How about the sheriff? Here it is. Oh, here's the sheriff. The sheriff. There's a new sheriff. Whoops. There's a new sheriff in town. This uh, this uh, sheriff wants to be your next uh, president. Well, didn't one, of, didn't one of the talk show hosts last night say, his doctor says, it's a new symptom. <laughs> Let's go to Jennifer in Chatham. How are you, Jennifer? Thank you for your patience and welcome oh. to the show. Hi. I am hysterical. Yeah, this is the... so funny. Um, I saw on an earlier program this morning, why pay the $99 when you can just copy and paste? Now, exactly. Uh, that I do not know. My for... Christmas holiday budget, I'm going to save myself a couple hundred bucks, <laughs> and I'm going to copy and paste, and I'm going to... Uh, put them in a little orange jumpsuit with those silver bracelets and give them to my Trumpian <laughs> friends for their Christmas presents. That is this so year. thoughtful of you, Jennifer. Freedom. That is beautiful. Loving it. Jennifer, thank you for the uh, call. And uh, again, that someday someone will come on the show and explain to us 
why someone would spend in the case of the statue. We don't have the Statue of Liberty photo of him, do we? The one that sold for 24 grand or they're selling, maybe it's a secondary market, I don't know. But Jennifer, thank you uh, much for the call. If you just tuned in, we're talking about Trump's NFTs. That was his major announcement yesterday. And um, apparently, from what we hear, they have raised so far a mere $4.45 million on these useless things, and they're sold out, which I assume means they'll have another major announcement tomorrow or the next day, saying they're now available yet again. And by the way, each of them, it's quite beautiful. He's on a football field. 45 is on the football. You know, he was the 45th president, that sort of thing. There's actually no 45 on the sheriff uh, thing, which is rather disappointing. Yeah, I that should is say. disappointing. It's, sort of brings the value down a little bit. Eight seven seven three zero one eighty nine seven. By the way, we have a lot of good stuff planned today, but if you want to talk about this for three hours, it is fine with us. <laughs> Let me tell you, I know I speak for Marjorie. It is very, very hard to resist after you've seen these uh, these uh, photos. You know what's interesting? In a, a moment of semi seriousness, he announces for the presidency, and of course that's on the heels of a disaster for Trump candidates. Have you heard, um, maybe I'm, have you heard, other than doing an occasional interview on uh, whatever it is, Newsmax or whatever that other thing is called, the other right-wing uh, lunatic uh, uh, news station, other than Fox News, because he doesn't like Fox News one, anymore. One American love, Network. A one news. American News, right, yeah. OAN kind of thing. Have you seen him? He hasn't done rally. He hasn't done any anything, right, except no. NFTs. By the way, I do have it. This is the one that sold for a mere $24,000. You not only... Sorry, there it is. Can you come a little closer, please? Thank you. This is Trump standing in front of the Statue of Liberty, winking, which is really appealing to me. Holding, what is he holding? I'm sorry. Oh, he's holding nothing. Oh, two thumbs up, which I also find very appealing. A mere $24,000, I assume, on the secondary market. It's quite lovely. Let's go to Ellen in Westport. What's your deal, Ellen? Oh, Ellen in Westport. You are exactly yes, who we, here I Here's what Ellen again. said and yesterday. Hi, oh, wait, wait, wait. Ellen, I don't know what Ellen was talking about yesterday. She calls yesterday, and I thought of you all <laughs> night, and she says, I can't even. Well, you know how I feel <laughs> today? I can't one. even. Yeah, this is Another can't even. Exactly. I can't even believe people spent ninety nine dollars exactly, for that Ellen. person. Thank you. He is. He, you know what? what? He's more evil than the Grinch. Oh, okay. That's saying At something, least my the friend. The Grinch gave back. Yeah. That's <laughs> oh my true. God. The Grinch gave Christmas back. Okay. He's not giving anything. Why doesn't he use that money? Is he going to use that money for to um, release those people or pay their fines? I believe he is. Yes. To, uh, I hope he does something because. Because this is just out of control. And I don't know what's wrong with people that they can't see what they're doing is crazy. I mean, come on. I mean, that that no. tops it right there. I Let me tell you something, express- Ellen, Ellen. Uh, my reaction to this whole thing is I can't even. Do you know what I mean, Ellen? <laughs> Thank you. Ellen, you're one of my favorites. Thank you for the call. Call us Beth- again really soon. Uh, oh, no, it wasn't Beth. It was someone else who said, I'd buy a card if one depicted Trump behind bars in a prison jumpsuit. You know, can we talk but about we that for, any of for 10 seconds? Uh-huh. Uh, if you didn't watch last night or Monday when Larry Tribe and on Greater Boston, when Larry Tribe and former federal judge Nancy Gertner what were there. What are you going to do without your TV show, Jim? What, what are you going to do? I'm, I don't know. I'm going to do Just it. Just call me at 7 at o'clock and I'll do a run through <laughs> for you. I'll interview <laughs> a neighbor or somebody. Uh, yeah, Larry Tribe. So Nancy Tribe Gertner and Gertner on the same on, stage. But by the way, what they, and they've been great to me and they've been great on the show. They both said unequivocally, and you know, probably the premier constitutional law expert in America, whose students include Barack Obama, Merrick Garland, Chief Justice Roberts, et cetera, et cetera, Jamie Raskin, uh, he's going to be indicted in early uh, 2023 by Jack Smith, Nancy Gertner, who was less certain about it a couple of months ago, echoed exactly what Larry Tribe said. I mean, on a serious note, we're going to have a former president of the United States, in all likelihood, probably by spring at latest, indicted on multiple charges, possibly on charges related to insurrection. I mean, it really is, it's unbelievable we're living through this, Marjorie. Well, it is unbelievable what's what's happened well, to true. this country. Yes, I mean, look true. what we just talked with David Leonard about, librarians know, being driven out of town on a rail 
and lives and threatened. Librarians lives, lives threatened, threatened in some parts of the country. And people accusing librarians of grooming children and being pedophiles. I mean, what's what's happened? He's happened. Yeah. Is what's happened? Unfortunately, Renee from Chelsea. Thank you for calling. Hello, Renee. Thank you for calling. Yep. Hey, hi. Long hi. time since I spoke to you. Well, glad you called. Listen, I'm thinking. I read this and I was cracking up this morning, but I think it's Melania. The NFTs are her too. And I think she said, oh, you know what would be a good idea? Why don't you do these and you suck them? I mean, it's a great for her, way for her to get rid of him. Look at how stupid he looks. Another genius. That, that, brilliant. Of this man. Renee, that is brilliant. Brilliant analysis. I like Thank it. you. By the way, is I Baked like Alaska, it. he or she is a January 6th defendant? Okay, here's Baked Alaska is the Twitter handle yeah. for somebody who's a January 6th, not only defendant, but a convicted January 6th defendant. Here's his tweet. This is great. <laughs> this is really great. I can't believe I'm going to jail for an NFT salesman. I mean, <laughs> how great is that? Um, he, this guy, uh, Baked Alaska, pled guilty to one misdemeanor. Thank you, co-workers, for getting this, that info. One misdemeanor charge carries a sentence of up to six months. <clears throat> His sentencing hearing is uh, in January well, I guess of next that, year. That is the question. See, that is the question to me, uh. Jim. How can he not know how pathetic he looks? Yeah. Th that, don't you How can that? he not know when he has his doctor say he's the fittest president who ever lived and he's going to live for another 100 years? How can he, I mean, how many things on the because list? Because I think that there are people that would believe that, that would say he's got great genes, you know, look at him, he's a, a, a big, big rough and tumble guy. I think there are people that would believe that. Yeah. This, is like, this is like a total miscalculation and it's very odd. Well, maybe. We only have a minute left, and Kathy and a car, it's yours. I'm sorry to everybody else, because I know everybody wants to talk about this. Kathy, what's up? Hi, can you hear me okay? We can. Thank you for calling. What's up? Wonderful. I think you two are fantastic, Thank and you. I'm laughing so, so hard. So are I we. I just want to say that, why do we, why do we believe this bluster? It's sort of like the large crowd at the inauguration, so I really wonder whether any of this is really truthful this morning. You mean the four yeah. and a half million dollars is total BS, either. you're saying, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, Probably. why do we even believe that statistic? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'll tell you, because I'll t I'm not laughing. <laughs> There's a new what? one. Aiden keeps popping these out. Can you get them? I mean, oh, this is just, can you get in this one? Oh, I mean, my this God. Is, what kind of person? Can you what, see this, everybody? Military fatigues? He's in, uh, I, I, I guess. I mean, I don't know. I, I really, <laughs> Kathy, I'm, uh, thank you. Is he with Maybe the special you're forces right. now? It's probably a scam. I don't I really don't know. So, uh, uh, what do you say? We're supposed to wrap up these segments. What What can you say? Actually, can we just play Donald Trump saying what the extra benefit is mm -hmm. if you buy one of these things? You'll be in a raffle. Let's hear from Trump, please. I don't know if that's an amazing prize, but it's what we have. Well, it's close enough. That's a little uh, <laughs> snippet of uh, Donald Trump, and we're, we're done. However, if you want to keep texting us for the next two hours with your thoughts on this, we will check the text machine, and we will probably read you know them. What? During the show. You we got to go. Say, Jim, we only have 15 seconds. Jump the shark. Exactly. Callie Crossley is next to tell us about the new president of Harvard University. You're listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH, broadcasting live from the Boston Public Library. You're listening to Boston Public Radio with Jim Browdy and Marjorie Egan. Just ahead, more smart conversation about what's going on in our community. That's right after an NPR news break here on GBH News 89.7.
coming up there first. Yeah. Uh, keep going, it's what I've been told. Okay, we'll carry on from where we stopped. Thanks, wonderful. Uh, yeah. Pyrenees, the White House. Rain, sleet, and snow have been making for tough commutes in parts of the Northeast. A winter storm is expected to last into the weekend, as NPR's Brian Mann reports. Heavy, wet snow has begun to fall here in Westport, New York, north of Albany. Wintry conditions are expected from Pennsylvania to New Jersey into Massachusetts. New York Governor Kathy Hochul says people should be prepared for slow, messy, and sometimes hazardous driving conditions. And that's going to be tough. Uh, our, peak, our peak is going to be about one to two inches per hour. What's concerning are the winds. Wind is expected to cause significant power outages across the region. Utility crews have pre-positioned in the path of the storm ready to restore electricity. The nasty weather means a long weekend for a lot of kids with school canceled in many parts of the Northeast. Brian Mann, NPR News in upstate New York. U.S. District Judge in Texas is pausing the Biden administration's plan to end the so-called Remain in Mexico program for migrants. We have more from Texas Public Radio's Maria Navarro. Remain in Mexico is a Trump-era policy that requires that asylum seekers hoping to enter the U.S. wait in Mexico while their court cases are processed. The Supreme Court issued a ruling earlier this year that cleared the way for the Biden administration to end the controversial policy. And the Department of Homeland Security announced it would no longer enroll migrants in what is officially known as the Migrant Protection Protocol Program. But a Trump-appointed judge, Matthew Kaczmarek, has ordered a halt to the planned termination of the program, saying legal challenges from Texas and Missouri should be heard first. That's Maria Nevada reporting. It's NPR News. Good afternoon from the GBH Radio Newsroom in Boston. I'm Henry Santoro. The president and CEO of the Boston Symphony Orchestra has announced that she's stepping down in a move that some say came out of nowhere. The symphony's front office made the announcement today that Gail Samuel's last day will be January 3rd, ending a very brief two-year tenure. The board of trustees says that Jeffrey Dunn, who serves on the symphony's board of advisors and finance committee, will become the interim president and CEO effective on January 4th. And Steve Poftak attended his last MBTA Board of Directors meeting yesterday as general manager of the agency, GBH Radio's Bob C. Poftak was recruited to take over the T almost four years ago when former GM Luis Ramirez was fired. He faced many challenges compounded by the pandemic, which Transportation Secretary Jamie Tesler noted. Those challenges were real, and every single day, you and the team showed up to confront things that we never confronted together before. Quincy Mayor Thomas Koch, chair of the T's advisory board, praised Poftak for his dedication and leading a transit system plagued by years of underinvestment and neglect. Poftak leaves January 3rd, two days before Governor-elect Mara Healy is inaugurated, and it will be up to her to choose Poftak's successor. Bob C., GBH News, 89.7. The Celtics host the Magic at the Garden tonight. The forecast, Boston looking at a lot of rain and wind today, tomorrow, and uh, tonight as well, with temperatures in the low to mid-40s. It is raining like crazy out there. Beautiful day if you're a duck and really wet in Watertown. Support for NPR comes from DuckDuckGo, a company committed to making privacy online simple. DuckDuckGo's app includes a private search engine, web browser, and email protection with one download. More at DuckDuckGo.com. I'm Henry Santoro, GBH News 89.7.
Houston Browdy. I am Marjorie Egan. This is hour number two of Boston Public Radio, broadcasting live from the Boston Public Library, and we are streaming live on youtube.com slash gbhnews. Hey there, Marjorie. Hey, Jim. Marjorie's home. If you just tuned in, she's still got COVID, but she is powering her way through. I hate that expression. <laughs> through the show. I don't know why I used it. And I don't know if you said this. We're streaming online at youtube.com slash gbhnews. And not only we get to see Marjorie with her beautiful new... Uh, Christmas lights background <laughs> that took her four and a half hours this morning That's to right. figure out how to do. But let me tell I, I want to say one more time. I, if on a dreary Friday before Christmas, you want a little joy in your life, earlier this morning when uh, Khalid Hill uh, rehearsed tapping, which he does in Urban Nutcracker, uh, uh, it was amazing. He's going to tap on the radio, and trust me, you're going to love it. And you can also watch it at YouTube. And then uh, Handel and Haydn, the players and their new leader, uh, rehearsed a couple of times. It is so beautiful and so full of life. And Callie's nodding her head because she sat through this too. Just really take an hour, come down, and if you're not feeling great on a gray Friday before Christmas, you'll feel great by 2 o'clock. You know something? Yeah. I, I was only, I could not see him tapping. I could yeah. only hear it. Was and it was incredible? just amazing just to hear it. Yeah, he is really talented. I mean, wildly. I know I'm stating the obvious. He is really good. In any case, we're joined now, speaking of talent, by GBH's Kelly Crossley. <laughs> Kelly's the host of Under the Radar with Kelly Crossley, which you can catch Sunday nights right here on 89.7 at 6 o'clock. Also the host of Basic Black, which airs Fridays at 7.30. You can hear her Kelly commentaries on Mondays for GBH's Morning Edition. Hello, Kelly. Hello, Jim. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. So Jim Kelly and Mark. Marjorie. Yeah. Hello, Callie. Hi. Nice to see you, even nice though it's on Zoom. I know. So tell us about the new president of Harvard University. Well, her name is Claudine Gay. Um, she was serving as chief of staff uh, to um, Lawrence Bacow for a while, the dean of Harvard's faculty, um, of, and then the dean of Harvard's faculty of arts and sciences. Um, she started at Harvard in 2006 as a professor of government, and in 2008 she was appointed as professor of African and African American studies. But of course the big news is she's the first person of color um, to lead Harvard um, as president, and the second woman, and that's an amazing thing. Um, yeah. When I first heard the news, first of all, I was just, you know, it's such a big deal, and I immediately wanted to find <coughs> out. Um, and confirm because I thought it was W.B. Du Bois, but I was incorrect. The first um, African American graduate of Harvard, it's Richard Tom, uh, Theodore Greener in 1870. Mm. W.B. Du Bois came later in 1890, and I thought to myself, if either of them could ever have imagined, I mean, you know, it just would have been beyond imagination to think that this woman would be the president of Harvard. You know, I have in the past occasionally been, like Drew Faust, who a lot of people think did a fabulous job, and I don't know enough about the inner workings of a university to you know if that's true. Mm -hmm. I thought that she didn't use what is potentially the most powerful education pulpit in the world enough. Bacow clearly did with this report on slavery that was mm -hmm. pretty stunning coming out of Harvard, and following up on that report, to have a black woman be first here, I hope she's not just a great president for Harvard as Harvard. I know that's her principal job, mm -hmm. but I hope she uses the bully pulpit that Harvard provides to help you know, change the world, particularly we're talking to David Leonard at the top about librarians being threatened, mm -hmm. book bans. There's so that's many right. issues that matter that a voice but like you know, that from a place like that can make a difference. Well, and, and it needs to be said, because you're saying it in so many words, that however Harvard goes, so many others do follow. So, so um, you know, she'll be watched very closely and, and how she presents to the world is, um, and uh, for Harvard is going to be very, very important. Uh, but coming from her perspective, it's really interesting. I want to say that, you know, Harvard was sort of coming behind um, to sort of deal with its, its legacy of enslavement. That's been a long slog. They were wise enough to bring in um, uh, uh, others who have gone through the, through the process and to really start to examine some of their own history, which I think is important. I remind people that uh, in 2016, there was a lot of back and forth and some discussion of that history around the uh, royal crest, mm -hmm. which, you know, by the, the um, a very important donor to Harvard who turned out to be 
um, uh, very much an enslaver and had some other issues. So Harvey's been wrestling with these issues um, already. And of course, she's not there to just deal with that. But, you know, that's a big part of also what they are ha having to come to grips Margaret, with. Margaret, I know you have a question. Can I yeah, play I some sound? We have sound from sure. her. I wasn't aware of it. Here she is, Claudine Gay, speaking in her announcement video on why the, the ivory tower is dead. Here it mm -hmm. is. The idea of the ivory tower, that's the past, not the future of academia. We don't exist alongside society, but as part of it. And at Harvard, we have a duty to lean in and engage and to be of service to the world. Well, that's the right thing in light of what we just right, talked about. Exactly. I'm sorry, Marjorie. No, I was just going to say, I, I don't mean to be too sappy, but I, to me, the, the symbolism here is really... Um, it's a real big deal, I think. You know, Maura Healy alluded to this when she became mm -hmm. uh, the first gay, gay governor of Massachusetts, first woman elected outright. You know, Jane Swift was, was appointed um, governor. It's a big deal, isn't it? It's a huge deal. Yeah. Why? I mean, it, it, it's um, just because in the history, she's the 30th president of Harvard. First of all, they haven't had that many presidents. Yeah, so that's true. to be the 30th president is. In and of itself, whoever was going to be was going to be a big deal. It's Harvard, as we've discussed, and that just you know is a model for a lot of people um, and other other scholars, and certainly in the educational field. But it has a bigger footprint than that, this, that as Jim has said. And so, and then on top of that, we're in the middle of of a huge discussion and uh, case in front of the Supreme Court. Well, of course, about you know about action. affirmative of action. Um, Harvard had taken some leadership in. Uh, looking at uh, using affirmative action appropriately, but some things they, it wasn't used appropriately. So, you know, uh, there's a lot going on that she will have to deal with. It, it was noted in the piece, uh, in the in the New York Times piece, that um, there was a little controversy that she had to take a firm stand on about a dean who had been accused of right. sexual misconduct and got some blowback from faculty. So, you know, you're dealing with faculty that's very strong, very well respected, um, you know, revered in some circles, many of these, many of these folks. So you're not just at the head of an institution in the way you might be on other institutions. This is a vibrant, um, in, with folks who have a lot to say and who in their own right, when they speak, many, many people listen. Can I state you know? the obvious, which mm -hmm. I'm an expert at? Uh, look at the last 15 months and the the ascent of women in and women of color. I yeah. mean, the first woman of color, obviously, to head Harvard, yeah. only <laughs> second woman ever. First woman of color to ever be a statewide office holder, Andrea Campbell. First woman mayor of Boston. Yeah. Five of the six constitutional officers. I mean, talk about an almost. It's amazing. Do you remember, Marjorie, when we started on the radio? We used to do quizzes and ask people if they could name. We I think we only had three members of Congress in the whole history of Massachusetts mm -hmm. who had ever who had ever been a woman in right. two hundred some years. And in the last 15 months, it's really unbelievable. It is interesting. So Massachusetts is some kind of test case, I guess, or, well, we'll or, find or out. business case or We're something. a little late to the fair, but yeah, we are but, a test case. But, I mean, but to your point, to have all of these important leadership roles filled by women at the same time. Oh, the Globe also, you know, I realize. Not yeah. only the editor, well, but true. the yeah, woman who runs yeah. the Globe. Yeah. Nancy Me Barnes, Linda yeah, Pizzuti, yeah. Susan Goldberg. Yes, at GBH. In yeah. general, in My Boston. God. Yeah. Estrogen on the march, Kelly. That's what I say. <laughs> We're talking to Callie Crossley. <laughs> so, uh, Bjorn Taylor, people remember she was the uh, young woman who was murdered in her mm -hmm. own apartment by police officers who uh, broke down her door. Um, her boyfriend, I, I guess, has gotten some level of at least, I, I don't know what you call it, he got a $2 million settlement from the city. Right. Uh, which is something, I guess. Well, I think we want to put that in the context of that. He, they were both asleep. Uh, he heard a noise. It was a no-knock warrant, meaning, you know, they didn't say they were coming in. He said he didn't hear anybody say, this is the police. So he had legal right to a weapon, and he used it, thinking it's an intruder. Shot one of the police officers in the leg. They came in, then full blast, and, you know, killed her dead. And he managed not to be killed in the, in the, in the barrage of gunfire. Uh, so there's been a series of back-and-forth lawsuits I mean, he sued saying, what are you, this is, no, this is wrong. Um, other people took up the cause, and then the police officers sued, countersued him. They lost that case. Um, and then about a year or so ago, the city 
made an agreement with the family for $12 million, which is one of the biggest settlements in uh, city history when we talk about cities uh, settling around police behavior. You know, this is something I've uh, written about quite a bit. There are quietly, really, this is more public, cities are paying off for bad behavior a lot. And I think if taxpayers understood how much money was going into this, millions, they, millions, would, they right? would have a lot more to say about you know, proper training, um, what, was, what really was going on there. Let's have a little bit more scrutiny about some of the behavior that ends up causing the city to have to uh, pay for a settlement. Now, in the $12 million set, settlement, they said, we're not admitting wrongdoing. I think the same thing may be true for this $2 million set, settlement. But just think about this. The woman is dead and $14 million have been paid out to the families and loved ones of the dead woman. That, you know, for something that many believe should not have happened because the no-knock thing is now illegal. Well, you know, um, not only a no-knock thing, but they lied yes, to get the no-knock warrant. So correct. even when it was legal to get one, it wasn't legal for them to get one because right. they lied in the affidavit to get it. They used a battering ram on the door, which is why yeah. Kenneth Walker the third, uh, the boyfriend of Breonna Taylor, got freaked out. And and by the way, to his credit, well, I don't know if credit's the right word, apparently he's given a lot of this money away yeah. to charities that have related missions to trying to cure this kind of of injustice, so it's not about he's being enriched by say, the pain he suffered. Right, the, the, probably the best interview um, uh, Gail King did with him. Oh, I didn't at, see it. Uh, this was uh, months and months ago when he finally uh, spoke and just said, talked about how in shock he still was, how he just played it over and over the night because he couldn't believe it. And, ha and then he also couldn't believe that he was being sued. And, you know, and he talked very candidly and poignantly about how hurt he was. And what people forget, he says, think, think, people think that the filing of the lawsuits has to do with, I'm going to you know, get a lot of money off of this. He said, I will never have the person I loved yeah, and course. I was supposed to be with. And that's where I'm at. And he said, I'm, he had to mental health counseling, a whole bunch of stuff. It was really very interesting to, you know, just hear from him uh, and feeling alone then at that point because she was gone and there he is saying, this is not right. So, you know, good for him for standing up. I'm not sure I would have the strength to keep fighting it at that point. I don't, I'm not sure I would. Okay, I want right, to hear Marjorie a introduces this next topic because it's a, a hell of a transition. Go ahead. Because that was a, was a real tragedy. Mm -hmm. I'm dying to know what you think about the Harry and Meghan uh, series I'll on tell Netflix. You what I think no, I have, in a not, I have not watched them. I've just watched the excerpts. Um, but, um, I, well, I'll just preface this by saying <clears throat> I get it if they want to talk about the racism, mm -hmm. I get it if they want to talk about the paparazzi. But I mean, do we have to hear about. Harry and Will screaming at each other up at the... <laughs> yeah, apparently we do. Well, like, I mean, what do you make of this, Callie? Well, first of all, let me just say, I've not watched it because this is my boycott against Netflix. I can't stand it when they break up the series. Netflix's bond to us was when we put something out, we put the whole thing out. So uh, I don't watch anything till the whole thing is out because that's my little personal there is a Netflix woman of principle, boycott. Tell you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, so that's the reason why I haven't watched it. But, you know, it's interesting. I think they thought that by having a contextual look at them in ways that nobody's looked at these royals, that we understand, we would understand more not only their relationships, but also the context in which they operate. And that might explain then the Meghan and Harry situation. I don't know if that's their reasoning, but I'm thinking that was. And it also could be something else in for a penny, in for a pound. You know, if we're going to tell you about yeah. this, we'll just tell you about all the other stuff as well, and you decide. What I have been surprised by, because I guess I just didn't realize how much they're resented in uh, Britain. I knew there was some, but apparently it's intense. So here in America is where they are finding their most support of people understanding and wanting to hear the broader story, where the Brits are like, shut the hell up. You know, what, is it, what did we read? A mere 80 million people watched the first parts of the first three episodes. 80 million oh, and people. I, and the, the, the back three are supposed to be the ones that are really expository. Juicy. Yeah. So I, right. I, I would suggest more than that. We'll watch that. Okay. Yeah. So the question I ask every time of either you yes. or Sue O'Connell, who's standing about 20 feet away, 
Why should I care about this again? I missed that part. Why do I care about this? Because it's a cultural piece. It's, 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 uh, it's high pop culture, is what I would say to you. So you don't want to be, a pers- as a person who has to be informed about a number of things. That's right. You yeah. have to be informed about this. Um, okay. Now, you don't have to grovel in it, but I think to know what's going on and to understand it and fit it into um, our environment right now as we talk about disinformation. Remember, part of this whole conversation from Harry is that this whole system was set up to spread disinformation about us um, when they decided they didn't like my choice of a partner. One, right. So I think it's I think in that context, you want to know about it. And I also think that it'll it'll probably reverberate. We'll hear more as it co- goes along over the years. Little bits and pieces will come out. Yeah, uh, okay. I mean, I really try. I mean, maybe people may think I don't try. But you know what the great ju- juxtaposition was? I'm watching my favorite anchor by far, Anderson Cooper, yes. last night on CNN. And I think right in a row, maybe there's something in between. He has, they have a royal reporter. Do you believe there's a royal reporter? There's several in there's on, many on CNN, of them. I'm talking yeah. about. Oh, a royal yeah. reporter. Of course, I mean, you have Britain. to have one. So too. they have a royal reporter describing this. And I'm trying, thinking of you and Sue and Marjorie, I'm trying <laughs> to show some interest. I know this matters, even though I don't know why. And I watch, and I couldn't get into it, you know, the inside story mm-hmm. of royalty, whatever. About two minutes later, they have this incredible interview by this woman, Jamie Gangel, who's oh, a reporter yes. at CNN, yeah. who sits Good down reporter. at a Chinese restaurant in the first ever joint interview. If you haven't seen this, everybody, you've got to see it. Okay. Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer. Okay. That is not only so insightful about what their lives are like, their, I mean, these you know, people, pretty important people in yes, our lives. Right. Uh, not only is it insightful, the thing that I can't get over, the most powerful woman maybe in the history of the United States, Nancy Pelosi, is eating mm-hmm. Chinese food with mm-hmm. Chuck Schumer and Jamie Gangel, and she's doing this interview with the camera. The whole time, Nancy Pelosi is stuffing her face the with food. Chinese food. It was I was like, so <laughs> real. I and loved so, it. I did I loved too. It, but it was, she was so very casual. She was just shoving polite. dumplings in. <laughs> she wasn't a Beijing wasn't, duck. Well, it was incredible. You had a whole segment on your last show last night about how you had I am food not on the speaker show. of the house. Marjorie. And you are eating with your mouth full. I was. She had that very was a good, good talking with your mouth full, I should say. Yeah. She had very good manners about it. She was shoving oh, the food in. Oh, here it is. In. It's on CNN right now, actually. It's great. But she closed her mouth. Mouth and wasn't talking when she had a mouthful of food. She was hungry. Yeah, you know, I love to great. see yeah. a woman eating, showing yeah. that she really loved those shrimp dumplings. They were spent fantastic. She said that. But I you know what? Right. You, so you're saying going, the juxtaposition. Yeah, just here is you. something yeah. that matters in right. my life. And again, yes. I, by the way, I care about the racism. Yes. I care about people being treated like crap, no matter who they are. Mm-hmm. But to elevate it to this level, I guess. Uh, that I still haven't connected, but I'm watching this and I'm saying, this tells me a lot about two of the three people who ran the country for right. the last, and that's and pretty intimately involved in my okay, work I'm, and life. Here's how I'm going to wrap this up for you. Okay. And it's going to be meaningful. Are you ready? Yeah. Is everybody out here ready? And We're ready. So. We're ready. Well, they say they are. We'll see. GBH's new statement about our caring is what matters to you <laughs> not what matters to you Jim Thank Brody you, okay, fine. <laughs> by the way on a much more important note I'm looking at your black Santa brooch yes can I tell you a brilliant idea that I just had that you must yes. have had yes why don't you stream a damn commentary from your office well with I a have c- a commentary about this but no but so people can, I don't mean about I, it oh, I mean so people it, okay. can see it yes okay. we all talk about it yeah but okay. let people see the damn office I will put up some more some uh, Lizzie Sloss came in and took a lot of oh, photos great. of one the of our colleagues. Samba. Great, yes, fabulous. You didn't say anything about the earrings. I didn't see the earrings. <laughs> oh, Black Santa earrings too. This How about is the like mask? Black Santa mask. <laughs> Oh, my God. Can you hold the mask up? Can we get a shot of the Black Santa mask and the Black Santa bro? Can we do that? Yes, we can. You're uh, something else. Thank you. We're talking to uh, Callie Crossley. Speaking of the holiday, which obviously are with Black Santa, Hallmark. I have to say, when I read this story, I thought it was Hallmark is doing LGBTQ holiday movies, including a rom-com. Tell us a little bit. Well, you know, they've been moving in that direction. There have been a few, a couple of them. uh, Last... um, Last su- oh, last summer, last um, holiday yeah. season, there were two or three, not only on on um, Hallmark, but also on Lifetime, and then um, a, a, another channel that I'm blanking on right now. So they've just sort of been going back and forth, and it, and they're actually really good, not just you know sort of sappy. Some of the 
the first one was very awkward. But I love the story that they're telling in um, the one that they're centering. You know, they always Holiday premiere. Holiday Center, is that yeah, it? Yes, the Holiday Center, the one that they're... Sitter, um, Sitter. Sitter, Sitter. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this is because usually it's, it's, you know, somebody has a friend or whatever, whatever. These people are two neighbors. One is trying to adopt a kid, and another has been tasked with taking care of his... Um, niece and nephews during the holiday seasons and just they're living next door so they end up in a conversation and then that develops into something else and so they're doing now what modern romances do they're actually talking about an issue that the issue of adoption which is one that we can have many conversations about and at the same time they're living their lives as people who are men who happen to be gay and have a relationship and it seems so startling because Hallmark for so long didn't have any persons of color, certainly didn't no. have any LGD, LGBTQ, and barely had a Hanukkah romance. The first one they had was horrible. Horrible! Horrible! Hanukkah horrible! Romance. Last year, they finally woke up and got a good one. <laughs> Let's play a little so. sound. Here's a little sound from this Hallmark trailer for the Holiday Sitter. And as Callie described, it's a workaholic bachelor, yes. Sam is his name, is asked to babysit for his niece and nephew, and he gets the help of a pretty attractive neighbor. Here's a little bit back and forth. Who are you? Jason. We're your family's neighbor. Jason's great with kids. I just need someone to help me until I get the hang of things. It was nothing like how I thought it would go. I'm going to tell Jason how I feel. Well, that's just 10 seconds of the holiday sitter I mean, on Hallmark. If you okay. like holiday movies, and I love them. So do I. Okay. Yeah, so okay. I'm okay. going to enjoy it. Uh -huh. I want to know, okay, we know about Love Actually, Bridget Jones, yes. you know, uh, Chevy Chase, you know, uh, National Lampoon Christmas. What are your favorite holiday Well, movies? at the top of my list, and you had the comedian on, and I'm blanking on his name now, but the top of my list is Almost Christmas. Mm -hmm. Not this Christmas. That's the all black cast one that gets most a, a lot of promotion. But Almost Christmas stars Monique and what is the name of the comedian? We'll oh my gosh. Um, Mike it's right on the tip. Jay. Bo Bo Jay uh, Jared? Uh, no. Uh -uh. Um, Almost tall, Christmas. Tall, thin, black guy. I can't think of his name right now. David? Uh, yeah. What, what, yes, J.B. Smooth. Oh. One of my favorite comedians. I didn't even know he's in he, that. From, from, from Curb Your Enthusiasm, for if people don't know. Let me just say, he has, a on the planet. he has a central role in Almost Christmas. And I have seen this movie 5,000 times. Okay. I've made my family see it 5,000 times. And we just scream every time. I'm it's ready. It's hilarious. Okay. Almost Christmas. <laughs> Almost Christmas. Give us one more. Um, I like Love Actually, as you said. Yeah, I like Love, Love, Love actually. actually. I watched the special two weeks ago. Yeah, it was really good. <laughs> it's a little um, embarrassing. <laughs> There was one last, 20th anniversary. Uh, last year, and I want to say it was a lifetime, and I'm blanking on the name of it, but it was a lesbian couple. Okay. And it was a classic, um, hadn't told the family, so we go home together, and then she says, just pretend that, you know, you're just, just my friend. And... It, Hilarity ensues, but it also is very poignant. That's you, a good one. You know, if you don't, if too you much, <laughs> two signs of too much time in your hands is you debate whether, uh, 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 what's the movie we were just talking about a second? Love Actually. Love Actually yes. is a, is, I love that. You like it or not. And yeah. the other one is you debate whether some Bruce Willis movie is really a Christmas movie. Yeah, it's what interesting. What is that movie? What's that movie called? Die Hard. Die Hard, thank yeah, you. Yes, yeah. How many hours of people wasted in their lives? It's this interesting. Sudden? Because it's a Christmas oh, yeah. party or something? Yeah. And the building's it's collapsing? Yeah, yeah. You never watched it? I watched part of it. On oh, a plane, but, by the way. Oh, yeah, you definitely should watch It's definitely worth watching. Can I do a throwback? Yeah. I have to say, the Jimmy Stewart movie. Oh, uh, it's, a it's a Wonderful Life. life. It's, a, it's really... It's a nice movie, but you know, oh, it, it upsets me so Why? much. Why? Because I keep thinking about how many people have sacrificed their lives. I, I went the wrong way every time I see it. Oh. Who, well, it who is, don't it come is, around. You it know? is a dark movie in many it ways. It is dark. Right? I agree. Yeah. yeah. And I and it just okay. it, it, ups, it I, that's so upsets me because I know people who have done that. Yeah. So you know. You know can I just say one last time. thing yeah. to Some promote people. this show? I like all, Miracle on Thirty Fourth Street. That's pretty good like too. Like that too. Yeah. All of our old shows are online. JB Smoove, who is beyond brilliant in in <laughs> Kirby and Theater, came on with us about two months ago. Yeah. And he destroyed me for 22 minutes. Is that you're nodding in agreement? You wait until I could not get a word out without yeah. him trashing me in ways <laughs> that were so painfully funny. Hey, check it out. Go go to GBH. Well, you check him out in almost Christmas, he and you a, will just scream. He's a, he's a genius. <laughs> Tally, what are you doing this weekend? I mean, what well, are you doing on air this weekend? Um, we're doing our very fun um, once a year. 
uh, look at Mike Wilkins, PRX, and GBH's The World Engineer does this quirky collection. Oh, the whole of, hour, I hope, yes, right? Yes, the oh, whole great, hour. Great. It's his 33rd year Yikes. of collecting these crazy songs. And we just have the most fun with talking about where he got them, who the people are. Uh, some of them are just crazy, like the Heike Lunta Snow Dogs. Snow dance. Song. I know it well. <laughs> anyway, it well. so it's so it's so fun, and it's just right for the holiday season. I've listened a lot. It is really fun. <laughs> yes. It is really a fun <laughs> respite from the crap that we're all dealing exactly. with. Exactly. We'll be listening, Kelly. It's great to see you. <laughs> Good to see you all. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kelly Crossley. Kelly Crossley. <laughs> Kelly Crossley is host of Under the Radar, which you can catch Sunday nights right here on 89.7 at six o'clock. She is also the host of Basic Black, which airs Friday at 7:30. You can also hear her Kelly commentaries on Mondays for GBH's Morning Edition. Thanks, Callie. Coming up, for 21 years, the Urban Nutcracker has been a holiday staple here in Boston. Just around the corner, we've got director Tony Williams plus tap dancer Khalid Hill. That's just up next. You're listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH. I'm Arun Roth. Coming up on GBH's All Things Considered, the RMV unveils a campaign to combat marijuana-impaired driving. Early snowstorms are making New England skiers happy and the local ski industry even happier. And a stage production of Life of Pi premiered at Harvard's Repertory Theater. We'll talk with the author about its transformation from page to screen to stage. Those stories in all the day's news starting at 4 on GBH's All Things Considered. Our programs are made possible thanks to you. And The Box Center, presenting Urban Nutcracker, a reimagined classic with a Boston twist that blends the music of Tchaikovsky and Duke Ellington at the Box Center Schubert Theater, December 17th through the 23rd. More at boxcenter.org. And Nutter, a law firm where you and your company's legal issues are addressed by attorneys committed to solving problems and uncovering opportunities. Nutter, uncommon law. Learn more at nutter.com. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. I'm Jim Browdy. She is Marjorie in Marjorie's home. She's got COVID, but she is making her way through the show. Love her for it. We are live at the Boston Public Library, streaming online at youtube.com slash GBH News, and you really want to get on the streaming in about five minutes, so rush to your computer or your phone and do that. And by the way, uh, Tuesday at noon, Governor-elect Healy will be here for Ask the Governor-elect. She'll be here to answer your questions and ours. I think our first such thing since she was elected on November 8th. Since 2001, Tony Williams' Urban Nutcracker has been a Boston must-see. This year's edition is no different, with updated sets and an LGBTQ spin on the classic Nutcracker story. It's also going to be broadcast nationwide on GBH 44 on December 17th, which is tomorrow. Tomorrow, right? More information on that in a moment. Joining us now is Tony Williams, again, the founder and artistic director of this incredible thing, Urban Nutcracker, as well as the founder and artistic director of the Tony Williams Dance uh, Center. Khalid Hill is with us, too. He is a... I, he, He's unreal. He's a tap dancer extraordinaire, <laughs> originally from here. He's also featured in this year's Spirited with Will Ferrell, was a member of the cast of the four-time Tony-winning musical Bring It to Noise, Bring It to Funk. Tony, Khalid, it's great to see you both. Great to be here. Great and by the here. way, Khalid, I saw you rehearsing this morning. I am so into you that for $99, <laughs> I will give you an NFT of Donald Trump <laughs> in a space suit. Is that something you've always wanted? I dreamt of this moment. I thought you had. It's coming to a place so, near you. So it is such a thrill to talk to you, talk to you both. Let's start with you, Tony. Um, tell people who don't know. Tell us about Urban Nutcracker. Oh, boy. Uh, it uh, started in 2000. Uh, I had a dance school that I started in Jamaica Plain. And I had Khalid and uh, his friend Ricardo come to my school to teach with me. I was teaching ballet. And Khalid taught tap and Ricardo taught hip hop. Yeah. And that first year, uh, 
about 15% of the clientele were boys. And I said, where did these boys come from? Boys don't come to a dance school in that percentage. And I said, ah, Khalid and Ricardo. There's something going on here. <laughs> and it was my first year, and I had the parents at the school, and I had a critical mass of help, and I'm saying, well, I should put on a show. And why not do the Nutcracker? Can't do the traditional one that I was involved with for many, many years. And uh, I have to do sort of a spin on it. And I said, let's do something with Duke Ellington, because I had heard his music and uh, that he does his orchestration of some of it. And um, so I said, it'd be nice to have the same storyline, but we need to bring it to the present time. We have uh, dancers at Downtown Crossing that dance for money to, you know, they have to make a living. And, and then we'll put that on the stage, and, but we'll still have the story of Drosselmeyer, who's a street magician. And, um, and so, I was, I was saying, is this going to work, putting Tchaikovsky, the classical, we do a beautiful snowflake scene with tutus and point shoes, but we also have hip-hop and tap. And, um, but we, I just put it together into a big stew pot and, and added some seasoning. And through the years, like we would try to improve it. And last year, that seasoning didn't work, put something else in. We have flamenco, we have swing dance, we have... Uh, uh, all sorts of uh, dance styles. So through the set years, against it, iconic Boston locations, right? E exactly. You have mm -hmm. um, you know the set designed by the fantastic Janie Howland uh, has the Green Monster, the Golden Dome of the State House. Yeah. Uh, it has uh, the Custom House. It has the Zakem Bridge, and it's just a beautiful set. And so it's called. Uh, it's a very Boston centric Nutcracker. What was the first one like, Khalid? Do you remember? <clears throat> you know, it's funny, I do, and it felt like a big experiment in taking a traditionally ballet-centered show and infusing other dance styles in it, you know? Um, Were you bought in right away, or did you think this was a little odd? You know, you know what's funny? When, you, when he first mentioned it to me, I, I don't think I took it as seriously. <laughs> Looking back at it, I, think, I, I thought it was just an idea. And then as, we were, as I was teaching at the studio, he said, no, nah, no, nah, we're really going to do this, and I want you to tap in it, and Ricardo, you're going to do some hip-hop. I was like, oh, wait, he's serious. <laughs> <laughs> and fast okay. forward 20 years, and we're here today. You know, we should say, uh, Tony, for those who don't know, I assume most do, but not, you're not just a producer of these things. You're an historic person in the world of dance. You want to tell us about the first that were in your life? Uh, well, I started... As a young dancer, I started late at 16 with the Boston Ballet and uh, came out of uh, sports and gymnastics. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and then I was actually a charter member of the Boston Ballet. 1964 uh, was when the company started and I was there for that. And my very first Nutcracker in 1965 was at the Old Back Bay Theater with oh. Arthur Fiedler conducting the Nutcracker. Oh so I was in that show. I was in the back line, uh, but every year I got to push up to the front line. And you were the first African-American principal dancer with the Boston Ballet. Yes. Right? I mean, that's, yes. He ignored that, of course. Yes. That's a pretty significant thing. Yes. How'd you get into tap there? <clears throat> that's a good question. Um, so I went to the Roxbury Center for the Performing Arts uh, growing up. And I'm originally from, from Roxbury, mm -hmm. by the way. I lived in Dorchester, then moved to Roxbury when I was 10. Um, so I, I, mean, I grew up in dance school, and, um, and like most local community dance schools, you had to take the main three, tap, jazz, and ballet. Those are the main styles. So, um, you know, I, I sort of grew up doing it, and then when I was 10, uh, a woman named Diane Walker, who's considered like the godmother of tap dance, she... Um, her along with Gregory Hines, they helped carry tap dance through the 80s and look her up, she's huge. But she used to come through to the studio and teach classes and Savion Glover came through, who's, who's the icon of tap dance and like taught some stuff uh, at that studio when he was doing the tap dance kid. Uh, and then I got a chance to do a show called The Great Tap Reunion when I was 10, around the time the movie Tap came out. So right around 10, that's when I started, I started sort of gigging and doing it professionally and learning from uh, some of the masters who would come through to Boston. Well, you're a master. And before you perform in just a second, <laughs> you want to eat your heart out, Khalid? I lived at 97th and Central Park West, one of the many places I lived when I lived in New York City. Okay. Who was the 
person who lived in the apartment next door to me before he was famous. I mean, I was like 4A, he was 4B. Who was it? And I'll give you a hint. I always had my ear to the wall just in case. Who lived next door? Gregory Hines <laughs> was my next door neighbor. Un he was not really? famous. I mean, he was part of the family, obviously. <laughs> yeah. But I'll tell you, it was just to see him move, <laughs> just to see him walk absolutely. was like absolutely unbelievable. That dude walks like a dancer. He walks, right? yes, indeed. <laughs> Do you want to mosey on over to the uh, stage, I guess, there while we talk absolutely. to Tony for a second? Yeah, okay. Khalid is going to perform for us in a second. And you're just doing, it's like an ad lib kind of thing, right? Improvisational, he is he. Uh, he just said so. Uh, Tony, while well, yes. Khalid's getting over there, uh, describe to us the fast forward of 20 years from day one when you created this thing. You guys were just describing and what people get to see tomorrow in 44. Uh, right. So um, they'll be seeing the show that we filmed last year, mm -hmm. and it was uh, sort of co-produced by me and my nonprofit, City Ballet of Boston and American Public TV. And uh, they filmed three shows at the Schubert Theater uh, last summer, and uh, uh, sorry, last December, and, um, and they put it together and it got picked up by 97% of the PBS That's stations crazy. around the country. And it's being shown on primetime in, in a lot of the big cities around the country yeah okay here he is uh and again you can go to youtube.com slash gbh news if you're foolish enough not to be at the boston public library here he is khalid hill Oh my God. By the way, I cannot tell you how many smiles there are and how many faces. That was unbelievable. Come on back, Khalid, will you? We'll talk for a couple. Wow, Khalid Hill. That was, uh, what'd you think of that, Tony? I'm always amazed. Wait, he, your mic, go ahead, say it yeah, again. I, I, I said, I'm, he gets, you know, each year he gets better and better and better. It's like he's always practicing. He never stops. <laughs> it's true. You know, may, may, may I ask you a, a basic question about tap dancing? Great. I mean, who came up with this? It's such a, <laughs> when you think about it, to put these taps on shoes so you could hear it. Where did it come from? That's a good question. I'll give you the small, complicated bullet version. Okay. <laughs> uh, improvisational aspects, African dance, through the slave trade, uh, and some of the movement aspects, the Irish jig, and then some of the hard-hitting aspects, the English clog. In America, those fusion of styles sort of came together. The English clog, Irish jig, African dance, uh, but a lot of the improvisational stuff of the style that I, the style that I do, the hoofing style, yes. 
is like Afrocentric. Why are you out of breath? Why is yeah, no oh. problem? Yeah, that's right. You know that's what? Right. I'm 43 today. <laughs> I used to be able to just kind of hit it real quick. And so, <laughs> what, what's in your head? You said that was improvisational. I mean, Absolutely. When you stood up. So, what are you thinking? Or do you think at all? Or do you just do, you just do it? I mean, you know what? It's uh, the, the best way I can describe it. It's like having a conversation, right? You have ideas. You understand language, uh, context, syntax, and you just kind of speak out of the abundance of what you know. And with tap dance, you know, our language is what? The toes, heels, shuffles, stamps. And I, I kind of take those rudimentary steps as my language base, and I have rhythm and ideas in my head, and I just speak like a jazz musician, you know? That's, that's exactly. By the way, it's almost as great watching your face as your feet while you perform. <laughs> no, I'm serious. It is you see like, the gears going. It is just, it is unbelievable. <laughs> you know, Tony, you also do something pretty incredible in terms of LGBTQ stuff. Patty mm -hmm. Beret was supposed to be with us today. Yes. I know she's not feeling so hot. Explain to people what's going on there. Uh, yeah, um, we, our tagline is diversity through dance, and it's not just uh, sort of who you are as um, a person. It, it's, it's for all of us. We have a big <coughs> tent, and, um, and we had done some shows. We did two shows, one in 2012, one in 2016. That was the basic urban nutcracker, but we tweaked it. Um, and we had a few uh, folks there in drag that could dance, and they were part of the cast, but they had to learn the steps. And so if it's, it was sort of same-sex type of, uh, we did an Arabian dance for two men, let's say. And, um, um, and, and I, I just feel that it's important with all of the hate that's going on around the world that we really need to make a stand. It's not just a racial thing or poor, rich, it's also straight, gay, and transgender, et cetera, trans fluid. Sure. So uh, we, in, in my whole life, I've been involved with many uh, folks in the gay community, and, and we're, I, th my, that, uh, I don't want to say my closest friends are gay, but they are, I mean, and I have a lot of friends that I was very close that have passed on from AIDS, mm -hmm. and so anyway. You know, That's by the way, if you recognize the name Patty Beret and you're wondering, <clears throat> she was with us, I don't know, two months ago. Remember, she was unfortunately the victim of that neo-Nazi sickness in JP during a Drag Queen story hour she uh, talked about. You know, Tony, you touched, you mentioned before, but just elaborate a little bit, that um, Urban Nutcracker has a lot of scenes of Boston. Um, like what? Uh, we do a version of Make Way for Ducklings. It's not from the book. It's not a copyright thing, but uh, we call it something else. And we have the ducks that come from the Charles River, and they walk across. They, they come down Charles Street, and there's a police person. Sometimes it's a man in my show. Sometimes it's a woman. And she or he stops the traffic and lets the ducks go into the pond at the public garden. And so that, and that's my favorite dance. And uh, I mean, besides Khalid, that's my favorite dance. <laughs> By the way, we've had Nancy Shern, who's the sculptor on the show, tons of time from Newton, who did oh, the incredible it, work and is still doing incredible work in amazing. her 90s. She's yes. absolutely. Um, yes. So how many times have you tapped at a library before? That's a really good question. I have a tougher question. <laughs> How many times have you tapped on a quiz show on national television? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> One time. Tell us about that. Actually, we have a little oh, sound yeah. from this. this is By the way, the only thing better than watching Khalid tap dance on Family Feud is watching the host, Steve Harvey, while he is tap dancing. And unfortunately, we don't have the video for you. We'll just play a little sound. Here's Khalid. And again, he did this on, he was tapping on... Is that the right verb, by the way? Do you say tapping or do you have to say tap dancing? Tap. You know what? We, we say tapping, we say tap dancing, we so say I'm okay. hitting. Yeah, you're, you're okay. Okay, fine. So here he is on Family <laughs> Feud, and we have some sound of Steve Harvey. To say he's enjoying it is a little bit underwhelming because he was wild, enjoying himself watching uh, Khalid perform. Here it is. <laughs> Boy, you don't know how good you made me feel right now. <laughs> All right, Khalid, what's the first thing you do when you think you're about to throw up? I would say hunch over. <laughs> hunch over. Get in that position. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, you do. Hunch over. Wrong oh, idea. Yeah, I didn't get that one. Did you win or no? <laughs> Family win or no? You know, we, we won one show and then we lost the, the next one. That is really sad. So do you, are yeah. you always ready? To, I mean, did you know he was going to ask you to dance? I, did you? When he, you, you did. know what? You I did. did. You did. But here's the funny thing. I, I wasn't, I mean... 
I wasn't sure if he was actually going to ask. They just said, have your shoes ready because we don't have know what he's going to do. Have your shoes ready. So they told me to bring my tab shoes and just have them ready in case he, you know, when he introduces us. And then sure enough, he said, let me see some. You, you know? ever go out without your tab shoes? Oh, without the shoes? Yeah. You know what? Here's the funny thing. I've been taught to carry my shoes with me everywhere. <laughs> Just right? in case. You never know, right? Like if I leave home, I live in Harlem, I always have a pair of shoes with me. Usually. <laughs> <laughs> Even going on vacation, I just I have a pair of shoes just in case. But you know, and, and then there have been times when I didn't have my shoes, and I get to a place and some dancers going. You know, why you ain't bring your shoes? I'm like, yeah, the one time I it's exactly my shoes, like you learn your lesson. <laughs> so you know, Tony. In addition, we're talking to Tony Williams and Khalid Hill from this fabulous Urban Nutcracker. Uh, we mentioned that it's gonna be on 44 last December's performance. You're also live at the Box Center Schubert Theater. Tell us a little bit about that. Right. We open tomorrow. We have our first show of seven uh, tomorrow at two o'clock at the, the Box Center Schubert Theater. And we have uh, actually four shows, uh, two tomorrow, two Sunday. And then we have the 21st, which is next Wednesday, the 22nd, Thursday. And then Friday's our very special LGBTQ show on the 23rd. And the shows are selling pretty well this year. I think folks are coming out of the uh, post 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 COVID funk. Wow. By the way, it's yeah. urbannutcracker.com. Mm -hmm. Make a note, urbannutcracker.com. Margie will mention it too. Yeah, and you're leaving. Are you going to be angry at me if I asked you to perform again? Because that wasn't oh, part no, of the deal. Are you serious? <laughs> no, nah, it's cool. It's cool. Would you do yeah. it? I'll do it. Yeah. And I was going to say, what are you going to do? But you're going to do the same thing. You're going to imp imp improvise, right? You know what? Yeah, I I I'll slow it down a little bit and I'll do it a little soft shoey. Okay, here he is again, that? Khalid Hill. A little soft shoey, I should say. What was he like as a kid, Tony? Just, just like this. Very <laughs> smart. A Boston Latin kid. He was, went to Boston Latin, got his master's at NYU, Tisch School of the Arts. And what is he like? As a, I mean this sincerely. 2001, he's in the premiere performance. He's dancing. I know he came back for a few years, too. He's dancing again in 2022. How would you compare his performances as a younger kid and now as a man? He's more... Uh, more perfected in his technique and uh but he has the same expression which is which is great khalid hill i could not be more excited here he is the great khalid hill The great Khalid Hill. <clears throat> see him in the urban nutcracker. Gentlemen, that was fabulous. Thank you so Thank much. You. Great to see you both. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, we just got a great uh, email, uh, text from Erin in Brooklyn who says her cat has been entranced listening to the tap dancing in Brookline. He's enjoying the performance. Hey, thank you very it's much. It's an interspecies kind of performance, I guess. Interspecies kind of thing. Thank you so much Gentlemen, for coming in, Joe. It's a thrill to meet you both. It's a pleasure. 
Thank you. Pleasure. Thank we've you for having us. We've been speaking, listening to the folks from Urban Nutcracker, founder and artistic director Tony Williams, and tap dancer Khalid, Khalid Hill, and we're so thrilled that they could come in. Uh, they've got seven shows ahead of them at the Bach Center Schubert Theater. For more information on dates and tickets, go to urbannutcracker.com. That's urbannutcracker.com. It's also going to be broadcast nationwide on GBH 44 on December 17th, which is tomorrow night. Coming up, Elon Musk has suspended the Twitter accounts of tech journalists covering Twitter. Folks from the New York Times, CNN, and the Washington Post, media maven Sue O'Connell is here to psychoanalyze Twitter's chief twit. You're listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH, broadcasting live from the Boston Public Library and streaming online at youtube.com slash GBH News. Under the Radar with Callie Crossley. Forget Jingle Bells, I Saw Mommy Cha-Cha-Cha with You Know Who, and the Heikalunta Snow Dance song are some of our new favorite festive jams. It's one full hour with GBH's own seasonal music collector, Mike Wilkins, sharing his quirky holiday hits. That's Under the Radar with me, Callie Crossley, Sunday night at 6 here on 89.7 GBH and the GBH app. Support for our programs comes from you. And Lyric Stage, presenting The Play That Goes Wrong, part Monty Python, part Sherlock Holmes, all mayhem. Now through December 18th at Lyric Stage, Boston. Tickets at lyricstage.com. And The Village Bank. The Village Bank was created over a century ago to help people build their dreams and create a better community. Learn more at village-bank.com. Member FDIC, member DIF. Trusted. Local. News. You're listening to 89.7 WGBH, HD1 Boston, online at gbhnews.org. GBH News with NPR, what matters to you. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Marjorie Egan is at home with COVID, but doing pretty well, it sounds like to me. I'm Jim Browdy, live at the Boston Public Library. We're streaming on youtube.com slash gbhnews. And by the way, Keep the stream on because uh, Handel and Hayden Hayden are going to be performing in a few minutes. We heard them rehearse and otherworldly great, so stick around for that. But and by the way, Tuesday once again, Maura Healy will be here for Ask the Governor Elect Tuesday at noon. So I think you're going to want to be here for that too. In the interim, here to take on the social norms and abnormalities of the day is media maven Sue O'Connell. Sue is the co-publisher of Bay Windows and the South End News, contributor to Current on NBCLX and NECN. Hello, Sue O'Connell. Good day, good day, good day. Good How day are to you? Hello, Marjorie. Nice to see Hello, you. media maven Sue good O'Connell. To see you. Great to see you. So. <laughs> Every week there's another crazy story about oh. Elon Musk and Twitter. Now, apparently, he suspended the uh, journalists who covered uh, tech and Twitter. Uh, they, he shut down their accounts, people from the New York Times, uh, Washington Post, CNN. What do you make of this, Sue O'Connell? So my delightful daughter, Ruby, reminded me uh, the other day, because Elon Musk has ruined my life, <laughs> right? You know, I, I was a big Twitter fan. I love the idea of the Tesla. I was a big Elon Musk fan. She reminded me that when she was 14, I said to her, you know, this Elon Musk, he's something. It looks like he's going to save the planet. You should consider going to work for him, right? Imagine, like, now she'd sure. be, you know, laid off and sleeping in an <laughs> office you know, in, in the bathroom at the office because he wouldn't let her go home. So um, the latest thing that Elon Musk has ruined uh, in Twitter is, um, I don't know if you know the whole story of this, there, is a, there was a kid, a young, a young man, who had uh, a Twitter account called Elon's Jet, I believe. And what he did was he would post the location of Elon's private jet and where it flew all the time. But course, it's public information. Public information. When you fly in the skies, you have to log with the FAA. There's all sorts of accounts out there following all sorts of people's jets and all sorts of air traffic. And he would post it. And Elon Musk, Mr. Free Speech, Mr. I will restore the rights of 
Donald Trump to uh, a po a post on Twitter. I will allow uh, Nazi sympathizers back on because I want to see how it goes. I believe in free speech. He banned this kid. <laughs> Right, banned him. And then uh, the account Mastodon, that's a, another social media site that's really starting to take off that people are leaving Twitter for. They posted the kid's post on Mastodon. He banned Mastodon. And then this started to become a story, right? So uh, technology reporters like Donnie O'Sullivan from C uh, the, the CNN. Uh, CNN, Ryan Mack from The Times, Drew Harwell from The Post, a whole bunch of other legitimate news journalists who cover Elon Musk, he just started banning them like crazy. Like now there permanent are- Permanent suspension. Permanent suspension, uh, not allowed back on Twitter. So what's happening here is there's a number of journalists who are just hanging on and there are a number of news organizations still posting on Twitter, but now you've got CNN considering whether or not it's worth being on Twitter. And you have to wonder what's the end game here? Like if all of the news people who provide the news that makes the content on Twitter leave, and and people who are uh, into um, a whole bunch of causes leave, who's left on Twitter? Well, you know, it seems to me the end game here, we talked early on what was the end game. Did he want to just own this premier social media platform? Uh, did When he started losing businesses, was there another agenda? Because obviously he wasn't going to make money if 50% mm -hmm. of the advertisers quit. And I've reached a conclusion, which I may change next week, it is all about politics. I mean, he basically endorsed DeSantis. Mm -hmm. His latest scam... Even though he didn't, this, he didn't vote last time. Oh, I didn't know oh, that, Oh, no, actually. he's endorsing and he hasn't voted. He's also uh, 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 tweeting a lot now about child exploitation, right. which has QAnon feel to it, at least from my perspective. And it seems to me he's sort of Trump in a different setting in a lot of ways. Yeah, he's, ta he's taking things that have a grain of truth, which is, you know, what all of these conspiracy theories are about. His, his one, one of his kids, the, the, the ba I don't know which, if it's the baby, the one with the, the alphabet name, the XI alphabet name. Elon Musk says that they were accosted uh, by somebody in a car, his baby was, I don't know who the baby was with, and he is saying it's because the flight data uh, was posted on Twitter, and he's calling he it... He calls it assassination coordinates. Assassination coordinates. Um, and, of course, he's saying that's doxing, which is when someone takes your private information and broadcasts it. Other people are pointing out that the yellow pages and white pages uh, also <laughs> used to do that. But he's not filed a police report um, as we're talking about this happening, and he's now on this rampage saying... This is why it happened. And, you know, some of the elected officials who were in the, inside the uh, Capitol during the January 6th siege, uh, who were having their locations posted on Twitter by people who were trying to kill them, and Elon Musk has reinstated some of those accounts. They're like, are you seriously complaining about your public flight data being posted when we were under our desks and you've allowed these people back on? Yeah, again, it's just that people aren't clear. All the data that he's complaining about is public data. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I would argue the second wealthiest man in the world can probably afford decent security right. for himself and his children. He's chosen to be a public figure. Right. There's some risks that come along. I mean, you know, really, this is really getting to a point. Why do you have two cell phones? I'm very important. No, seriously. <laughs> I just noticed. This is the one if the FBI comes, I give them this one. Well, and then I hide this one. This is my work phone, and this is my um, personal phone, and I have information on both of them. Oh, very important, Jim. I'm very so, I have a lot of jobs. That's pretty incredible. <laughs> Me and Maven Sue O'Connell, we, we would be remiss if we didn't ask you to weigh in oh, on yes. uh, Trump selling his uh, oh. uh, digital trading cards with him, his little head inside a astronaut suit. Or I'll hold wearing. it up again while you're yeah, talking. Uh, yes, because yes. it's Here amazing. It Here he is in an astronaut is... suit. Can we get a little, this, a little closer, yeah. please? Do you Thank think you, this right is here. a sign, as uh, one of the late night TV hosts said, of yet another symptom or something having gone seriously Very awry? All right, so let's, let, let's, let, let's unpack this? this some more. I know you've please. unpacked it already, but yeah. let's unpack this some more. Keep doing that. This is a man who sold steaks. He <laughs> sold a pretend college. I think he had Trump water. Uh, yeah. He's had, you know, he's a wine. He, wine. All of it was awful. Much of it went bankrupt. Uh, people were suing him for not getting what they wanted. So the idea that he might think this is a bad idea or a good idea means absolutely nothing. And how many does he really have to sell in order to make any money? It's just a grift. It's just a grift. So we all talk about it. Some poor soul out there is going to be willing to pay money. He doesn't even know what an NFT is. You know he has no clue what these things actually are. It makes him feel good. I'm sure he feels proud about how what a great body he has. You know, he's the same weight as Colin Kaepernick. 
<laughs> and uh, and real, that's what he says. Remember in his 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 report. That's right. His medical right. report said he was the same height and weight as Colin Kaepernick. Well, when they when doctor, what's the name of the guy, the scam artist who also oh, molested gosh. people who's in Congress now for who is his doctor? Oh, was Jackson, Obama's, Ronnie Jackson. Ronnie Jackson, Jackson, who was also Obama's doctor. We should yeah. say when he was president. One of the best lines Chuck Todd from Meet the Press ever used with us was right after the, he said it was the healthiest guy ever. He says, you know what the doctor said? He says. Mr. President, you want to be 6'3"? You're 6'3". You want to be 215 pounds? You're 215 sure, you're 215 pounds. pounds kind of yeah. thing. But so, by the way, you know, a lot of people called and texted us saying the f they were sold out allegedly 4.5 yeah. billion million. I don't believe that. I, I totally believe it. What you, as you said, people bought all this other crap he sold. Right. Why do you think that no, people I I just idolize him? Didn't buy yeah, this? Yeah, I think they will. I just don't think it's. I just don't believe anything he says. I think that there will be a resale market on this. I mean, this is like when you're. You know, you, my dad came home from World War II with, uh, you know, Vichy coins. You know, this is kind of what this is going to be. But they were real. That's the <laughs> difference, right? That's a good point. <laughs> can you imagine, by the way, just I, I know we've spent too much time on this already, but with your permission, Marjorie, can we spend one more minute on this? Certainly, Jim. So Donald Trump is sitting at Mar-a-Lago. Yeah. And either he or one of his staff people, this is what, sort of what Steve Bannon said, you know, who were... Who signed off on this thing? Well, How did this... Why do you think there's any kind of intelligence or maturity there? Who signs off on saying, hey, let's put these top secret classified documents in a storage facility? Oh, who <laughs> says, hey, let's let let's see if... When he was the president, they didn't have a skit. They had... They sat next to guests and planned bombings yeah. at, 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 at a reception. I mean, why are we surprised that these bad ideas just keep coming out of him? And you plus, know, he'll, make, he'll make money on it. You know, I, what I forgot, when I mentioned before, I think we were talking to Callie about this fabulous, fabulous interview on CNN that Jamie <laughs> Gangel did with Schumer and Pelosi at a Chinese restaurant in Washington. <laughs> she doesn't the thing care. I forgot is yeah. Schumer, while Nancy Pelosi is, again, Constantly eating, which I loved. I mean, never stopped eating the whole time. A Schumer turns. She was hungry. Jim, a, a, hungry. A, 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 a Jamie Gangel is asking about the first. I think the first, the infamous meeting with Trump, where he says, "I won the gen the direct the popular vote." Yeah. And she turns him and says, "Mr. President, that's simply not true." <laughs> but a, Schumer interrupts while she's eating, and says, "You know, Nancy Pelosi really knew how to deal with Trump." I th I'm going to get the numbers wrong. She's got five She's children. She's got 5,000 children. X number of grandchildren. So grandchildren. she knows how to yep. deal with children. Yep. And Donald Trump was a child. Yep. And he said it so beautifully. And Pelosi, while well, she's eating dumplings, is nodding <laughs> in agreement. And yeah. there you go. No, in any amazing. case. Okay. It's like, yeah, he drew this. Look, I drew this. And can you, can you put this on the fridge? Here you go. Let's see if we can bring up the NFTs from the performers in the Handel and Haydn Society in a couple of minutes. I don't know if we can <laughs> okay. do that. We'll try. So uh, President Biden has signed the Respect for Marriage Act, um, and it prohibits states from denying the validity of out-of-state marriages based on sex, race, or ethnicity. It's not a 100% kind of thing, but it's, it's something. Yeah, Here's, no, can I play, try, can I play yeah, Biden, by the way? Here's just a very quick bite from him as he's signing this uh, bill earlier this week. Oh, the, uh... My fellow Americans, the road to this moment has been long, but those who believe in equality and justice, you never gave up. Well, that's true. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I talked with Julie Goodridge uh, this week oh. of the Goodridge uh, lawsuit uh, that brought us same-sex marriage rights here in Massachusetts, which then led to um, marriage equality across the country. And we've been, um, you know, with all the folks in Massachusetts, when Clarence Thomas released his uh, his uh, opinion, opinion uh, yeah. uh, talking about how same-sex marriage would be next after Roe v. Wade, we've been darkly joking like, hey, getting the band back together. Here we are, you know, the party's back. And Julie was at the White House along with a number of other oh, Massachusetts residents, a couple of the other plaintiffs oh. uh, for the signing. And, um, you know, it struck me, one of the, the biggest biases I think I've ever had in my, in my life, and I didn't really grow out of it until I was in my 40s, and I, I blame my mother for this, <laughs> was that I think that I thought that when things changed, they would stay changed. You know, I thought yeah. that when uh, yeah. she taught me about civil rights and we would drive through the South, that, oh, well, we're, th that Jim Crow was terrible. We won't do that again. That's great. We know that now. Or the Holocaust won't happen again because we know that now. And it, I used to say to you guys when I'd come on and we talk about marriage equality, listen, all we need to do is, you know, get our rights and then we'll go home and we won't come back again and you'll never hear from us again. And Julie, you know, reminded me, as well, that this is an ongoing fight for every single one of the rights that we have in this country that we care about. 
just because it's in the Constitution, just because your state has it, just because one thing or another, you have to keep fighting to build the foundation and the wall around it. And I don't mean it in the wall sense, but you know, this is just, an, it's, this isn't perfect, this legislation, but it's another protection. And we always have to keep fighting for the protections for the rights that we care about. Yeah, it shouldn't oh, have to be that, that way. That was it, even spontaneous applause. Look at that. It's just well, <laughs> you yeah. know, the same is obviously true in terms of uh, abortion uh, rights. Right. Now there are some people that are going to go after. Uh, they want jail time for people who help women get pills so they can do a medical, uh, a, a, a pill-induced abortion. Which phone yeah. do you have to check for that one? I'm sorry. That's right here. This left would be my, left, uh, my okay. left sign. Okay. Um, and I'm going to tell you something about, we're talking about the Texas um, anti-abortion organization. You know this new AI um, um, Artificial, Pro intelligence, artificial intelligence yeah. program, write this. Yeah. Oh, we did it the other. Oh, yeah, not write this. We did another one. Right, and this is, yeah, day, and yeah. this is write this, which is the other one. And yeah. usually, oh. uh, this is kind of a deviation, but Go ahead. Um, usually, you know, we get stories that we're going to talk about. This is a story that was in the Washington Post, and I usually read it, which I did, and then I go through it and I pick out the points so that when we discuss it, I'm ready to go. Mm -hmm. So this morning, I cut and pasted the first six paragraphs. And I put it into the program, mm. and in two seconds, it gave me everything that would have taken me 40 minutes to do. Wow. I'm still wow. charging you the same amount of money. But <laughs> it says, <laughs> you know, that the largest anti-abortion organization in Texas, creating a team of advocates to investigate citizens who might be distributing abortion pills illegally. Now, of course, these abortion pills are illegal, but many people have uh, access to them on a regular basis. Um, and this is probably very difficult to enforce and there's a number of issues uh, commerce issues state line issues uh, the post office but this is the next round as you as you say marjorie to protect the access to legal abortion and to medical abortion uh, these pills are the next battle line here. but we're even pre dobbs weren't pills medical abortions the primary Method? Yeah, there, I think it's the majority method so um, in, Early. in the United States. Uh, and it's, you know, again, uh, I had this discussion with somebody this week. The, the numbers of abortion in this country have dropped dramatically. The numbers of unplanned pre pregnancies dropped dramatically. The number of teen pregnancies dropped, dropped dramatically. dramatically. So this argument that we're having and this energy that we're putting into uh, having to secure safe access to abortion rights, if we kept doing this with uh, education, uh, sex education, uh, contraception education, and Planned access Parenthood. to medical, Planned Parenthood, we would continue to have fewer abortions, and we wouldn't need to have these draconian crazy laws about them. You know, the theme that you talked about a minute ago, one of the stories you read about Biden signing the Respect for Marriage Act did a really nice story of talking about his evolution on not just same-sex marriage, and we all know he did that thing on Meet the Press, which mm -hmm. essentially outed Obama, so Obama had to come on board faster that he intended to, and on uh, abortion. And I have to say, and m people may, listening may say this is your liberal bias, Jim. It, a lot of people have politicians talk about evolutions, which you know when you listen to them are total BS. Mm -hmm. They're totally poll-driven, quote, evolutions. Or transactional. <laughs> but exactly. Yeah. But when you read, I don't know how you feel, I'm curious now how you feel. When I read the story about how young senator, and he was the youngest mm -hmm. senator, I think, you can legally. I think when he was elected, he was not even old enough to be a senator, and he became 35 mm -hmm. by right. the time he was right. sworn in, if I remember correctly. And obviously, his wife and kid, and that was mm -hmm. that horrible nightmare. Uh, uh, I found the evolution of Joe Biden from conservative Catholic to where he is today to be totally credible. Am I naive? No, absolutely. And I think that for, for people of his age as well, I mean, listen, there's there's... The, the challenge that we have as humans is that when we want to be pregnant, when we are pregnant, as soon as we're pregnant, yeah. it's our baby, right? There's, no, there's really no, no, talk, no concern about that. Um, and it's hard to imagine if you've never been in a situation where you don't want to be pregnant or you've been forced to be pregnant that you can't think of it that way. And that's the challenge of why if we work towards the prevention of un un unplanned pregnancies, you can change the dynamic. And of course, he's very religious, right? You know, he's, he's, he's gone through that transformation. Um, I mean, I think... One of the hallmarks of Joe Biden is, is his evolution, his ability to understand the root of what the challenge is, because he experienced it. And then the more you learn about 
who needs abortions, who's been denied abortions, the more sense it makes. And he's able to bridge I that. that. I mean, that's, I think, why he got elected. Okay. okay. <clears throat> well, Sue. I'm going to take all my phones. It is odd, by the way. It is <laughs> How many really screens do you have? One. What's that? Two. <laughs> What's in your pocket? Three. <laughs> Sue O'Connell, it's great to see you. Great Thanks to see so you guys. Thank it's you. here for Sue O'Connell. Thank you so much, <laughs> Sue O'Connell. We've been talking to Sue O'Connell, our media maven. We very much appreciate her coming in. Sue O'Connell, I hope you have a wonderful Christmas. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Sue O'Connell is the co-publisher of Bay oh, Window, yeah. South End News, contributed to Current on NBC, <laughs> LX, and NECN. Thank you very much, Sue. Okay, up next, we're going to have a real treat for you, another real treat for you, musically speaking, today, a live Music Friday special performance on Boston Public Radio from the Handel and Haydn Society with their brand new, soon-to-be musical director, Jonathan Cohen. You're listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH. We are broadcasting live from the Boston Public Library and streaming online at youtube.com slash GBH News. I'm Arun Roth. Coming up on GBH's All Things Considered, the RMV unveils a campaign to combat marijuana-impaired driving. Early snowstorms are making New England skiers happy, and the local ski industry even happier. And a stage production of Life of Pi premiered at Harvard's Repertory Theater. We'll talk with the author about its transformation from page to screen to stage. Those stories in all the day's news, starting at 4 on GBH's All Things Considered. Support for GBH comes from you and Bernadine Sung Magison with Compass Real Estate, helping you navigate the evolving Massachusetts real estate market. You can meet the team, see listings, and more at homesbybernadine.com. And MSI United States, their providers are committed to bringing contraception, reproductive health care, and all the opportunity that comes with choice to women in the most remote parts of the world. More at msiunitedstates.org. I'm Adam Riley. Tonight on Talking Politics, we're digging into the biggest stories of 2022, from Florida Governor Ron DeSantis shipping migrants to Martha's Vineyard, to the litany of problems plaguing the MDTA, to Democrat Maura Healey cruising to victory in the governor's race after pitching herself as the successor to outgoing Republican Charlie Baker. That and more on Talking Politics, tonight at 7 on GBH2 and online at gbhnews.org. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. I'm Jim Browdy. Marjorie Egan is at home because she's got COVID, but she's done a spectacular job. No surprise to anybody. I am live at the Boston Public Library as our next guests. You can see them. We're streaming online at youtube.com slash GBH News. And a reminder, we're back at the library on Tuesday, joining us at noon for Ask the Governor-Elect. Maura Healy will join us live at noon to take our questions and yours. It's time for, I guess, another Live Music Friday performance on BPR at the library by the Handel, Handel and Haydn Society. I am pathetic. The country's oldest continuously performing arts institution in the, is it 207 or 208 years, Jonathan? 208 years they've been around. The Handel and Haydn Society has had just 14 musical directors. The great Harry Christopher stepped down, I'm sure you know, this year, leaving some rather large shoes to fill. Luckily, H&H &H found someone to fill them in Jonathan Cohen, sitting here at a harpsichord. He's a musical director designate. He starts in the new year for Handel and Haydn. I'm not going to introduce all your fellow performers. You will in a minute, because I'll butcher them. They've got a show. It's called A Baroque Christmas, playing tonight and Sunday at New England Conservatory's Great Joy. Jordan Hall. You can get tickets at Handel and Hyden, H A Y D N dot org. Jonathan and all your fellow players, welcome. We're really happy to have you. Thank you. Let's hear it for them, yeah. please. Thank you. 
Okay, this is an absolute thrill to have you all here with us today. Uh, I'm sorry I can't be there in person. But uh, let, Jonathan, explain to people who may not have had the pleasure of listening to the Handel and Haydn Society, what is it? What is the Handel and Haydn Society? Yes. Um, what are you surprised by the question? <laughs> It's, um, as you said, it's the uh, oldest performing arts institution in the US, um, and we're doing great concerts, great music, and we're bringing the joy of uh, Baroque and classical music to the public, and um, we're doing lots of great education work with youth choruses, and we're enjoying lots of music. Tonight we'll be playing the Gloria from Handel, I think. So, uh, Laudamus and Corniam will do. And you've got the harpsich harpsichord there, which, of course, most Beautiful. of us think of pianos, right? But you've got a harpsichord there. Tell us yeah. about the harpsichord. Well, the harpsichord, I suppose, was um, a kind of precursor to the piano, let's say. It's a little bit different, not to be too technical, but the, when you press a note, the little plectrum goes up and plucks a string. And a piano, you know, has a hammer, which yes. plays. So this is a beautiful instrument made by Alan Winkler in Boston, the Boston Harpsichord School. Especially a really nice instrument to play. It's pretty beautiful. So, Jonathan, the oldest performing arts organization in the world, is that right? And one of the youngest music directors, that would be you. Right. Why don't you get the job? <laughs> Come on, let's oh, hear it. Yeah. It's a big deal. How'd you get the job? <laughs> well, I... I, 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 I <laughs> no, I mean, um, I in, in, enjoy very much doing this kind of music. I, I suppose that we really found with the musicians, we really shared a, a sort of similar view to doing the music, to a kind of uh, sort of a very passionate and um, a sort of, a sort of vitality in the way that we make music. It's like a big chamber music, and that's exactly what I love to do. Well, your musical resume, which obviously you're too modest to talk mm -hmm. about, is insane. But in addition to that, one of the things I read, which made me feel great, you're a Brit, obviously, I think that's fairly obvious. Right. Oh, you sorry. apparently <laughs> have a love affair with Boston that was part of what the allure was from those who decided to pick it. What's the genesis of that? Well, for sure. I mean, um, after the number of concerts that we've, we've done uh, here together, I found such a huge um, enthusiasm from the Boston public. I mean, it seems to be such a, a place of uh, opportunity and culture. And, and um, you know, you just uh, turn around to look at the audience in the concerts, and they're all smiling and just with a great love and commitment to this kind of music. So. You know, you, I don't think you were watching, when you were rehearsing, I'm sure this is the experience mm -hmm. you have absolutely everywhere. I was looking at the audience, not you, and that's, you meant the joy on the faces of people that this brings, it's just, yeah. it is, I was yeah. gonna say stunning, but I guess it's not stunning to you, but it's actually really beautiful. Oh. And you experience it and feel it, I assume, when you're playing, do you not? Yeah, for sure, I mean, it's one of the great things about music, it can be a transformative experience, and it's something that we all, share together in, in the moment of performance and, and it's really a connection between audiences and, and musicians and that's what it's all about somehow. Are we going to hear some music? Well, I want to ask you one more question. Sure. When you're playing, is it period music? Is that an appropriate set of terms? Well, yeah, we, we play on instruments of the time from the composers. Yeah. And mm. so do you reinvent them for lack of a better verb? Yeah, for, you do. I think that's what we do. Um, music, in a way, I, I always say that it's this thing where we, we we play a note and then it's gone. You know, mm -hmm. it's in the moment, and it's it's that's that's the beauty of it. It's uh, there's the, um, a little danger in it as well, and it's really a, a communication in the moment of the emotions. So, Jonathan, before mm. you tell us what the first piece you're going to play is, do you mind yeah. introducing your fellow performers? Say again, sorry. Do you want to introduce your fellow performers? Yes, of course. So we're really lucky to have us with us this week, Robin Johansson, uh, soprano. Uh, well, as you, she well, can really sing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I oh mean, my God. And the piece that we're going to be doing is almost. I mean, people might not appreciate this, but it's almost unsingable. It's very, very, very virtuosic. This first piece. So we're so lucky to have Robin with us. She's, she's great. Yep. Um, Christina Day Martinson and Suzanne Algata on violins. We have Hi. Guy Fishman on cello and Heather Miller Laden on bass. He told me he plays bar mitzvahs. Is that true or is that no? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you got to do, is that the deal? What are you playing for us, Jonathan? We are going to play two movements uh, from Handel's Gloria, which he wrote when he was about, well, 20 years old. It's a very youthful and energetic piece. Fabulous. Can't wait. Okay. Yeah.
Incredible things I've ever seen. I think the hand, the twenty-year-old Handel Jonathan, was trying to torture his soprano. I mean, that was one of the most incredible uh, renditions. That is so difficult. Please explain the level of difficulty involved there. <laughs> well, I mean, it's just it just flies around, doesn't it? It's yes. Constant notes. So you know, in terms of. Uh, in terms of accuracy and breathing, I mean, it's just, um, it's a phenomenal thing that Robin just did, so, bravo. <laughs> Can you pardon my ignorance for a sure. second? You're essentially the conductor of this effort, yet I think if people are watching, either at the library, they know you are not standing in front of your fellow performers, you are playing the harpsichord. How does that work, exactly? Well, in this situation, what we're really doing is chamber music, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I was not conducting the, the uh, group, um, but I mean, you know, we've been rehearsing this piece because we played it in the concert last night and we played it on Sunday with a larger formation. And when there's a larger formation, it needs sometimes then a little bit more uh, help with the conducting. How do you do that? Well, uh, well, you just move your hand up and down. No, I understand. <laughs> I, I've seen. <laughs> but you're playing the harps. You're aware that you're playing the harpsichord while you're doing this, yes. correct? You were aware of that. Yeah. Yes. Well, you know, in, in, in Baroque and classical music, um, the role of a music director was somehow a little bit different to music of the later periods, where when you have a very large group of people, let's say in a Mahler symphony, it becomes kind of imperative that the, 
the conductor is not playing an instrument. But in the older style of music like this, or music, baroque music, um, often it was led from a violin or from a harpsichord or from a singer, you know. So we play together and that's, that's one, of the, one of the great uh, things that I love about this kind of music. Well, you know, it has so much energy and so much life. I don't even know what the appropriate words are, but it is so oh. full of life. Great. It is incredible. What else are you going to play? When do you, you start next year? Yes, twenty three, twenty four season. So yeah, okay. yeah, next next so year. You're just part of the I'm band designated right now, at the moment. Kind of thing, exactly. Yeah. What are yeah. you going to play for us again? You're playing something else. Yes. Yeah, we're going to do a little piece by uh, Arcangelo Corelli, and we're going to play uh, the Sonata Opus Four, Number Seven in F. But we're going to just do the first two movements. It's a it's a very short piece, Great. but um, we'll play that now. Can't wait. Before you thank them, uh, you know that great line from Groucho Marx is nothing like a professional, and I am nothing like a professional. Yep. Every fact I could have gotten wrong, I got wrong. <laughs> there is no show tonight. There was one last night. It sounds like it was great. Is that correct? Yeah, it went very well. But it was it's a real too, pleasure. too yeah. late for people because it was last night. But oh. there is one Sunday night, Jonathan, I want you to know. <laughs> and there are very limited seats left, we are told, in the balcony. As a matter of fact, four seats to be specific. Right. So I would suggest you go to the website. Yeah, you that move fast. Don't By the way, you guys are spectacular. Do you want to say something? 3 p.m. Uh, 3 p.m. Sunday, Jordan Hall, handlandhyden.org. So I got that wrong. I got last <laughs> night wrong. I got the name wrong. But I know I love you guys, so I got that right. You were fabulous. Thank you all. You were Thanks just very beautiful. Much. It was totally this beautiful. This has been a wonderful treat. Thank you very, very much for being with us. You've been listening to music from the Handel and Highland Society under the leadership of Jonathan Cohen. And thank you again. That was a wonderful it's treat. Beautiful. Totally uh, for beautiful. more information about tickets, apparently there's almost four none left. left. 
for a Baroque Christmas, which takes place Sunday afternoon at the New England Conservatory's Jordan Hall. You can go to handelandhyden.org. That's handelandhyden.org, but you better hurry up because there's almost no seats left. Okay. By the way, Jordan Hall is a fabulous venue. I mean, to, to watch a concert, it is Jordan fabulous. Hall is a fabulous venue, and Handel and Haydn Society is one of the great treasures of Boston. It is totally, and it's a, it is. It's especially at Christmas time, it's an Thrilling. unbelievable um, treat. Anyway, uh, we're taking a quick break, and then we're going to come back and do one of our typical Christmas little call-in things. Don't be as disparaging as you are. <laughs> You're really setting the wrong mood. Hey, okay. we're going to do one of our favorites come Christmas time. What is that, Marjorie? Well, regifting. Jeez. There's inflation going around. Exactly. Money is tight. Thank Does that you. mean it's okay yes. to foist and reopened and repackaged gift yes, on some unsuspecting yes, family friend or member this Christmas? We're going to ask you that, 877-301-897. You're listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH. Hi, y'all. It's Melissa Harris-Perry. And on The Takeaway, we look at news a little differently. We ask tough questions and explore topics you don't always hear about. That's because we're focused on amplifying the voices of communities. And at The Takeaway, we don't just talk, we listen. We bring your voice into the conversation by asking questions about what you think. Next time on The Takeaway from WNYC and PRX. This afternoon at 2, here on GBH News 89.7. Funding for our programs comes from you and Eversource. Eversource knows the role energy plays at the center of life for you and your family. And because of that understanding, in times like these, they offer plans that can help this winter. To see if you qualify, visit Eversource.com. And Johnson & Wales University, committed to going beyond the classroom by allowing students to develop the network and real-world experience to excel. You can explore more at jwu.edu. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy and Marjorie Egan live at the Boston Public Library, streaming online at youtube.com slash GBH News. While inflation seems to have eased a tad last month, there's no question that everything is more expensive this holiday season. One way you can save money is to re-gift that thing your mother-in-law gave you to someone else. It's a classic holiday gifting debate. Is it okay to re-gift? Do you do it? And have you ever gotten caught. 877-301-8970 to call or to uh, text is the number. So Marjorie, I'm unaware. Have you ever re-gifted anything? Well, yes, I have, Jim. Oh, well, what happened, Marjorie? <laughs> now, Marjorie doesn't want to tell this story, but it's one of my all-time favorites. She only tells it once a year. So get over it, Marjorie. What kind of re-gifting experience were you involved in, please? Well, what happened is uh, one of my closest friends closest came over friends, to my yes. house, yep. maybe for Christmas Eve sure. or something, and brought me a lovely a package. I, I believe there were gift soaps, Jim. Oh, that's really nice, I believe there nice, were gift actually. soaps. I love those, yeah. And the next day, I was going to her house for sure. Christmas Day, and yeah, I had her? forgotten to get her something. Oh, that's unfortunate. And so I rewrapped the gift soaps. Mm -hmm. Somehow, I'd forgotten that she gave it that to she you. had given them to me, mm -hmm. and I brought them to her home. Yeah. And she unwrapped my <laughs> newly wrapped present and said, my, <laughs> these look familiar. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was mortified. I was mortified. So for I, those not playing close edition, mm -hmm. you get them, let's say, on a Tuesday. Yes. You open them, you rewrap them, and you give them back to the original gifter on a Wednesday. Is that That's correct? Right. The next day. Not even twelve hours. That is sort of the fine. essence right. of regifting. The, the two rules of re -gifting. I've written I've read about a hundred stories on regifting yep. through the years, and there are two cardinal rules. One, do not give the gift back to the person who gave it to you, which Marjorie violated. What's the other one, Marjorie? I don't know. You what never the leave one? the card that you got oh, God. in the thing. Oh, God. You can't leave the card. That's a terrible That's a real I've problem. I've gotten that with liquor. Haven't you got that when oh, yes, put, I have. put in the liquor bag and yeah. it says to Susie and Steve? And I think, who's, <laughs> who are who's Susie, Susie and Steve? Steve? <laughs> 
<laughs> exactly. I don't know. So we want to know the pros and cons of regifting. Have you done it? Do you think it's a principled act? And by the way, a lot of people think if you do regift, which is perfectly fine in my book, as long as the thing is new, uh, uh, do you have an obligation to tell the person that it's a regifted thing? Or is it not ethically necessary? Well, Jim, you know, I read the etiquette story, and I've decided I'm going to solve my problems with regifting this year. I'm, what I'm going to do instead of regifting mm -hmm. is I'm going to make my own mince pies. What oh, do you think about that? Yeah, you'll be doing that really to, soon. Give it to everybody. 877-301-8970 is the... Uh, Phone. Are you ever had anything regifted to you? As far as you know, do you? By the way, do you do it except for what you did to your buddy there, who shall remain unnamed? No, not gen not generally. I, sometimes you're caught short. You know, someone comes over to your house and you didn't think they were going to give you a present. And they show up with a present, and then you have to go frantically going up upstairs, rummaging through things, and try to get them something before they leave. But what I've what I've done lately is bought extra bottles of of wine, well, so that if I have an unexpected uh, gift, I can reciprocate with a nice bottle of wine. We uh, we work with a woman who Marjorie's the most disorganized person who ever lived, and she isn't offended by that because she knows it. I is am and admits very disorganized. It. We work with a woman who shall remain unnamed, who's one of the most organized people ever. Uh -huh. And on that note, you probably don't remember this. She keeps at Christmas time a whole like case of wine in her desk so that when you go over, if you do, to give her a gift, this has nothing to do with regifting. she just pulls something out of the drawer as if she also had your gift ready to go. And she does it so seamlessly. Who's that? Well, if you think about it a minute, I'm pretty sure you'll figure out okay. who it is. 877-301-897. Right. We're talking about regifting. And by the way, even though Marjorie is feigning enthusiasm for this, I am totally into the topic. She's going to pretend she's into the topic, and we hope you are do too. You, do you regift, Jim? I, 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 the reason I, I think I did once or twice years ago, and then when I heard your story, it caused me to be so fearful yeah, that I'd you, commit the same faux pas that you did you've got to that be I really don't think careful. I've done it since. What you're supposed to do, it's sort of like wedding gifts. Don't people do on wedding gifts when you get a lot of gifts, you write on the name if they don't have a card with it, who gave it to you so you know what to say to them. Same deal here. you got to write it down, or if you re-gift, you're going to create a major problem. We're supposed problem. to call it, though, we're not supposed to call it re-gifting, according what are you supposed to, to the etiquette it? expert. We're supposed to call it pre-loved. Not secondhand, oh, not regifted. That's right. I'm sure they'll move You can put it in a, a beautiful people. bag or box, or even a cloth bag now because they're reusable and environmentally friendly. Oh, and good for the environment. Of That's course. right. And so um, it's it's fine. People are looking to cut back on costs. Yes, they are. And 41 percent, according to this uh, story in mm -hmm. the uh, the Sun, this is a British paper, are looking to cut back on presents. And so the etiquette expert from Great Britain, and who knows better than the Brits on these etiquette matters, what you should do. Can I tell you one thing? Brendan, our colleague, doesn't get it. Brendan mm -hmm. writes us a note, said, Brendan may or may not have used the gift card his brother got him last year to buy his brother's present this year. That's not a violation of a of regifting protocol, is it? I don't think so. Sort of like he got cash and you used part of the cash to yeah. buy. I don't, uh, Brendan, I think you're totally fine. Janet in a car, you're first on Boston Public Radio. The topic is regifting. Welcome. Hi, guys. Thank you for taking Thank my call. You. Thank you. So I work for our local um, recycling office. Basically, oh, great. we focus on waste reduction, mm -hmm. and we actually encourage people to regift or to shop secondhand because how much of this stuff actually ends up in our landfill? Very good point. And our landfills are definitely filling up. So anything we can do to, to reduce waste is a good thing. Yeah, but I, I, I assume you would agree, that at least I feel this way, maybe you don't, I shouldn't assume anything, that the thing has got to either be new or sort of feel new, don't, don't you think, or, or am I... Not necessarily, because there's a lot of consignment shops where you can get stuff well, that's that a good point not too. you at all, and you can go to thrift stores, and there's uh, antique shops, there's all, I can't tell you over the years how many gifts I've gotten from antique shops and consignment, because people know I love that stuff. You know, by the way, my younger daughter does exactly that, so I don't know what I'm talking about. Janet, that was a great call. And, and we purport to care about the environment here, so I guess that is a really good alternative to traditional gift giving. Janet, thanks for your call. Bill from Gloucester says he's seriously considering regifting what he got for becoming a sustaining member. <laughs> That's not a nice. A Prince album set at Prince Tambourine. What? Wait, from us? <laughs> from GBH? I don't think so. I don't think so. Maybe he got, became a sustaining member someplace else. I don't remember talking anything about a Prince album our show. set. No, he didn't. And he wonders if he should feel guilty. He says he kind of does. Jenny, Jenny in Long Island, thank you for calling. Hi, Jenny. 
Hi, can Hi. you hear me? If you yes. said, can you hear me, we can hear you, yes. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Well, my, I have a story about re-gifting. Please. Uh, we were at a family gathering, yeah. and uh, my aunt gave my father a beautifully wrapped bottle of scotch. Mm-hmm. And my dad had an expression on his face sometimes that was just like Jack Benny's. And he lifted the bottle of scotch up where I could see it in the light. And there were only two inches of scotch left in the bottle. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's a pretty a good, one. good one. That is a, That's yeah. even worse than Marjorie's, I that's should say. That's a good one. <laughs> hey, uh, Jenny. Yeah, it's one of my favorites. Well, it's one I'm of my favorites for- now, too. Same to you, yeah. Jenny. Thank you for the... Jack Benny, by the way, I know there are a few people who probably don't remember. One of the great comedians from another era, but a genius. Comic that must genius. have been an evaporation kind of mess, do you think? I think... Well, I would say that when the bottle is open, even if it's really high-quality stuff, <laughs> it's time not... To, even with that first caller about recycling, it's time not to recycle the bottle of uh, liquor. Would you not say? I, I, think it's, I think it's probably not a good idea. You're correct, Jim. Matthew from Westboro, thank you for calling. Hey, Matthew. How are you? We're good. I had a, um, a gift from a college uh, I was working at, and uh, they uh, gave lottery tickets, and I gave them to another party the same day, like added them to a gift that I already had. And then this party tried to make believe that they won all this money, and they were trying to see how I would react. And? They were like, oh, my God, I won all this money. Because, you know, it was just it was too close because the two parties – kind of knew each other so even though they were like the the one uh, twos and five uh scratch tickets they kind of knew that the you know the brand so but they played this game with me which was kind of funny they were like you know oh we won all this money and they were like trying to play off and i was like oh well great that was glad i'm glad you didn't because i i kind of felt they were probably joking but it was kind of a way of playing a game with me well so, wait a second would you have been as generous and kind if it, they were not joking yeah, yeah. No, I was, I was happy for them, but they were playing game. Yeah, they were what like, wrong oh, my God, you? I got $1,000, and they, oh, my God. And they were, like, you know, making it really believable and playing this whole game up with me. And it was like, uh, so I was just like, okay, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was just, like, playing playing along with them. Well, they and sound like a really funny couple to me. Along. Hey, Matthew, uh, uh, happy Christmas. Thank you for the uh, call. Would you be nice to people? If you gave, if you regifted a lottery ticket, lottery tickets are great Christmas presents, by the way, I should say. Really great if you don't know what to get somebody, you don't want to spend a huge amount of money. Uh, would you feel good if you gave someone a lottery ticket you had gotten and they won 1000 bucks or 5000 bucks or would you or not? I would probably feel bad because I would have thought, geez, I could have been me. $1, could have been a contender. <laughs> but not so bad. Imagine if they won a million. Oh, my God. Yeah, I can And you could, like, retire early, Jim. You sue them is what you do. Pat in Boston, (laughs) you're next on Boston Public Radio. We're talking about re-gifting. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Uh, Thanks for having me. Sure. Um, I really like the uh, the Marjorie story about uh, being, you know, giving the soaps to someone that uh, she knew very closely and, and responded. I actually would expand that that I have I somehow have a big Irish family that's also very, very small and knowing, like, gifts and what people got each other. So we, I kind of have a safe zone. If I'm going to re-gift something, it's not going to be to someone within my ex- my smart. immediate family. Oh, good thinking. Uh, secondly, uh, I love Jim. Your point. I actually, it, the what is the status of the gift? Is there a hole in something? Is there a broken box? If it's top shelf, let's go. Life is short. And the last thing is, we re-gift um, uh, bottles of wine and alcohol, like liquor. If we're going to to events and parties all so the do time, I. so do I. A, a new a new gift bag from CVS does wonders. Then it's a new gift. So, that is beautiful. That uh, was an excellent call. You should write a column on regifting every piece. Of, <laughs> no, I'm serious. Everything you said, and Pat, the last thing you said about wine, that is probably the best thing to regift. That's a fabulous thing. Excellent advice, Pat. Thank you for the uh, call. What are you laughing Here's about? Here's a good one. My partner who may not be my partner for much longer, but I digress. (laughs) My partner's mother gives things like bubble tea kits and knickknacks from home goods or Christmas tree shops that I won't even use, so I've often given them to others not connected to the two of us rather than buy something. Paul from Braintree asks, who will be the first to re-gift a Trump NFT? (laughs) I would say everybody who bought a Trump (laughs) NFT will be the first. Uh, uh, Paul and Braintree. Mike and Avon, you're on next on Boston Public Radio. We're talking about regifting. Hey. Hey. Good afternoon. How are you? We're excellent. Thank you for asking. What's uh, up? Thanks. We were living in our uh, 
boat in the Caribbean, and we went to tour a rum factory that was really interesting, but the rum was the worst stuff I've ever drank. Mm. So we gifted it to another boat, which then went up island. It got gifted through three other boats, and somehow a year and a half later... <laughs> Ended up being gifted back to us. That's pretty good. <laughs> How did you know that it was the original bottle? Because there was a slight scratch on the label I had gotten when I bought it at the, at the rum factory. And there was only about half an inch missing out of the whole bottle. We still have that, and there's still the same amount in it. That's pretty. Now, let me ask you something before you go away there, Mike. If you are uh, on your boat, I assume we call that yacht, in the Caribbean, why are you re-gifting anything? Um... Living frugally on a boat is the way you have to go because uh, things are not as cheap as they are here in the States. So we were only there and retired with our kids because uh, we live frugally and uh, it, the, uh, it was awful. I really can't drink the stuff. Yeah, it sounds like I have a horrible life on that boat in the Caribbean. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Merry Christmas to you. What's that? I once got a gift from my boss of a necklace that she had worn to the office several times. <laughs> That's horrible. That. that is really horrible. <laughs> Can you imagine? Do you not feel in your body the embar? Well, you do because of the soaps. The embarrassment that people must oh, feel when they do this. I mean, it's really cringeworthy kind well, of stuff. Well, at least it was to one of my best friends who forgave me. If it had been someone like you know your mother-in-law or someone you didn't know. Well, by very the way, well. that woman who shall remain has about the driest wit. In, on she the does. planet, and I yeah. can see her face as we're speaking oh, when she reopens the box. These look familiar. <laughs> My, my. That's pretty good. Where do you want to <laughs> Where go, Where have Martha? I seen these before? <laughs> Where do you want to go? Katie from Cambridge. Hey, Katie. Thank you for calling. Hi. Hello. Can you hear me? We can. Yes. All right. So some of my friends and I started a tradition where after the holidays, we do a Yankee swap where we re-gift the worst gifts that we got. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so it becomes very fun. Um, last year, I lost... Um, a package of t-shirts that I really wanted and ended up with a can of mussels, which I didn't even know you could buy, get. A Nor can did of I. Mussels. Yeah, so I just still have those in my cupboard if anybody knows what I can do with them. Maybe I'll re -gift them again. I, I would if I were you. <laughs> the whole concept of a can of mussels is really not terribly appetizing, repulsive. Katie. Yeah, repulsive, that was the word did I was you, looking for. Did you see this one from Hey, Art Katie, from thank you for the call. Did you see this one from Art from West Bridgewater? No. GBH regifted the photos from the last smug mug and used them on the latest one, just cropped them differently. Well, I, I, we have no idea if that is true, but there's a different <laughs> slogan, it's a different mug, it's a different color, and the new one is not available, so eat your heart out. It's not going to be available till the next pledge drive, but Marjorie and I each have one of them. And people who, by the way, people who did the pledge the day before the pledge, two days ago, actually were lucky enough to get one too. They really are a prime prize there kind of thing. Oh, we have someone who's very fond of their own Christmas dickies who says they will not re-gift them or give them to anyone because they love their Christmas dickies. Do younger people listening to the show know what a dickie is? A dickie, we've discussed this. Jim? A dickie is sort of like a faux turtleneck, which I think we're in vogue. But people told us last time we talked about it, they're back in vogue. They're sort of a little, like a little rectangle. It's almost like a bib that you wear under your shirt. That's it's right. a faux turtleneck, and it was really huge like in the 1930s. Thomas <laughs> in a car. We only have a minute left. It's yours. Take it away. Thomas. Excellent. I'll, uh, I'll be quick. Uh, yes, uh, uh, amusing and humiliating uh, regifting story. My wife received a, um, uh, a gift card to the Clark Cookhouse down here in Newport, um, which we were very thankful for, but then she needed a gift to get to her um, her assistant mm -hmm. uh, where she works, and so we passed it on, and she was very excited about it. Brought out her uh, her new uh, gentleman friend, and they set out for a nice dinner at the Clark Cookhouse. Turns out the person who had given it to us had either knowingly or unknowingly spent all but twelve dollars on the hundred and twenty five dollar gift. <laughs> And so that, they went to pay for their bill. That is really bad. And, uh, and we got a phone call. That is a bad one. That's a good way to end. That is humiliating. 
Uh, Thomas, you're an honest man willing to engage in full disclosure. Thank you for that, and thank you all for your re-gifting thoughts. We're done, Marjorie. Okay, we are, we are done for today, and thank you very much for uh, listening to another edition of Boston Public Radio. I certainly hope you enjoyed the wonderful uh, music, oh uh, Urban dancing. Nutcracker, and oh Handel and Haydn Society. You can keep up with us 24-7 by way of our podcast. Monday, we'll bring you live coverage of the January 6th committee. Uh, 10th hearing ahead of their final report that will start at 1 o'clock. We'll start, of course, at 11. Before that, we'll hear from GBH's Tori Bedford on Mass and Cast, the Ground Truth Project's Charlie Sennett on the latest in Ukraine, and PBS travel guru Rick Steves. We want to thank our crew, Zoe Matthews, Ed Conley, Mackenzie Farkas. And we want to give a special thanks to Fernando Cervantes and Brendan Didi. They've been, uh, they're going back to school, Fernando to Tufts and Gia to Wheaton College, but they've been terrific, helping us all semester, Gia, since the beginning of the summer. They've helped us produce the show, pull sauce, research, and book guests. And thank you very much, and they've done a great job. Can I throw we, my two cents there? Yes. I'm not always crazy about <clears throat> Uh, bringing these people on. Not only I mean these people, but people in general, because it's often more work supervising them for the staff. Gia and Fernando They've are as great. good as we have ever had in our 25 years in radio. They are wildly talented, have great futures, and we thank them for everything they've done with and for us. We do. We thank also you. want to thank our engineer, John the Claw Parker, who's a little under the weather, and our Bill Piacitelli, who sat in today for John, our executive producer, Jamie Bologna. Special thanks to the BPL team, that's the library team, Sai Patel, Colin Cockrell, Evelyn Brito, Angelica Marrero, and Brad Lewis, uh, you're not on TV tonight. No, I'm not, not on, on TV, TV ever, any, at least on that show. I may be back on TV, but not that if show. By the way, it, look for Jim's show last night. It was a good night. show. It was it was absolutely good show. And you were fabulous, by the way. Well, it was you were fun. Really it was fun. Fabulous. But the stuff of you making fun of yourself was a riot. Well, you were a lot of help with that and making fun of me. But it was great. And your star turn, as I say, was fabulous. And thank you all for coming in the library. We appreciate that. Uh, have a wonderful week. And by the way, you sound like you're losing steam. Marjorie worked with COVID today and yesterday, and it's great you did. And I know it's really hard because you don't feel so hot, but hopefully you're fully recovered by Monday. I hope so too. Have a healthy weekend. I am Jim Browdy. I'm Marjorie Egan. Thanks again for tuning in. Hope you have a wonderful weekend as well, and hope you can tune in on Monday. See you later.